everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to yet another episode of the New to Retro Review podcast. This is episode 11, and today I have two very special guests uh, from across the pond. They are the, well, most of the team members from the First Aid Spray podcast. We have Cy. Hello. And we have Steve. Hello. <laughs> welcome, guys. Uh, thank you for taking the time off of your day to, uh, to come out and do this. I know it's like, what, like 5.30 there where you guys are? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's cool, it's good to do, because, I mean, we've been talking about sort of reconnecting and recording something uh, for a long time now, so it's good to just sit down and have a chat. Mm, yeah, cause oh, I... no, I'm missing out on doing my gardening, what a shame. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way, the way food prices work these days, you might as well do some gardening and grow some vegetables. <laughs> oh, no, no. You see my garden, Tony, you would not be saying that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. It's like little shop of horrors out there. <laughs> got a plant 42 growing i think uh, maybe 43 <laughs> 45 plant 42 the only way to keep the kids off my lawn exactly <laughs> get off Little my bear. lawn <laughs> oh my god this is off to a great start already <laughs> but uh so yeah no i mean like you guys had me on your podcast a while back when you did the uh the barry burton episode and everything which was that was a lot of fun yeah it was like two years ago now can you believe it i know right like it's been like it's been such a long time. Why haven't I been back? You guys are terrible. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying so hard. No, no. Get a Devil May Cry episode out. <laughs> oh, no, dude. Like, I, uh, no, no, just joking about that. But, like, seriously, like, you guys are, like, literally like, one of the best podcasts that, like, I listen to because you have, like, like, your whole team is just great. Like, from, like, like start to finish, like, you guys, like, have, like, one of the best. Because, like, I don't, I also have the attention span of a goldfish, so I can't really stay tuned in long for, like, podcasts. But, like, you guys is, like, one of the podcasts that, like, I can't actually listen to all the way through. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's, well, that's nice. I'm always good to hear. Yeah, no, it's just, it's just like, I, I see it, and I'm like, these guys need more fucking love. Everything, okay? Like, <laughs> these guys are, like, out here, and they are pumping out, like, hit after hit. Like, they're doing, like, you guys do great stuff. And I'm just thinking to myself, they need more. More! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of cool, because we're in, we're in a bit of a boom at the moment, especially with everything going on with Resident Evil. Obviously, people have... All the eyes are on the product, so it's it's we're on our way. We're building up slowly, but yeah, I mean, happy for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> of course, no, it's just like I it, it's something that always bothers me. Like when I see like amazing content creators and like they don't get like the recognition they deserve. Like, you know, I know the community loves you guys. Like I see like the posts you do on like your your regular socials and the F8 spray uh, socials and stuff, and people just go nuts for it. And you know, like, that's the thing. Like you guys are like real. Like, that's the thing, it's, it ain't no bullshit, no, like, fucking show, no personality, like, it's all real, and I think that's, like, part of the reason why like, I love, you know, like, working with people and talking with people is because they're real, there's no facade, there's no, like, I'm covering this, like, to be something else, I'm really, like, an asshole underneath, like, everything is on the table with you guys. Yeah, 100%, 100% honesty, like, it's, when it comes to, like, giving our opinions on stuff, it's, it's straight up, um, and I think people appreciate that, and also not necessarily just because... We don't just sit there and bag on everything necessarily. If something's <laughs> like we don't like it, we we'll at least sort of like poke fun at it rather than just say, "Well, it's shit because I said so." You know. I don't know. I distinctly remember you talking about a certain boss fight in a recent Resident Evil game, and you just kind of. <laughs> I mean, I mean, let's 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 be around the bush. Heisenberg's boss fight is shit, but you know that's that's by the by. Also, I got to say that word without be beeping it because <laughs> our listeners will be very confused because we we. Uh, we keep our, our ship very tight. I I keep everything nice and wholesome. So on, when they listen to this, they're going to be like, whoa, that's what Sai sounds like when he swears. <laughs> <laughs> well, some people think that swearing is like, you know, barbaric or it makes you, like, it makes you try to sound like something you're not. But like, it's like when you're, like, when you become an adult, it's just something that like works into like your everyday vocabulary. Let's face it. We all love swearing. We all love swearing. It's good fun. I'm a child of the <laughs> 80s. I grew up watching action movies. Of course I'm going to drop the F-bombs and shit, you know? <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I think like, one of the other subjects like, I think I love the most uh, is uh, when you guys like do like top five videos. Like You guys really like think outside the box with like a lot of the, the, the stuff you do. And the way like that you know you just like put the videos together and like what you're talking about, like it's really like precise and interesting. Because I do like top ten videos and top fives, but I'm just like... I feel they don't have the quality that these guys do. Like, they're, they're really doing good. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. I mean, a lot of that, yeah, it just comes from sort of, like, bouncing ideas around people. And not even necessarily just people on the team, you know, like, people on the Discord server and 
some of our ideas which is yeah just come from our little community said you know why don't you make a video on hats you know <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that and yeah so as wide a net as we can possibly go with it i mean that's the thing i always well, this is like pulling off a can of worms here but like when you got a podcast that primarily talks about one game franchise you need to get like really into the tiny details sometimes to squeeze out that content we could rush through talking about every single game and then be just kind of done but yeah we're trying to take our time i think just covering everything that we can you have no idea the level of like uh organization and like dedication Sai has in that they have like a excel spreadsheet that i'm pretty sure lasts into the next four years in terms of just what we do in <laughs> Like it's mad master plan schemes. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah. not, it's not inaccurate to be fair. <laughs> like, uh, to, to to say that the boss there is like organized and and puts anyone else like in in the team to shame would be like, an understatement. It's scary. Uh, yeah, no, I, I I can't organize a shopping list, let alone half the stuff side does. It scares me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh yeah, that that's great. But yeah, like I mean, like you know, like your your videos and stuff like that. You know, like I remember, like you, you did like a, I think it was like a month or so ago. Like you did like five loose like Resident Evil story threads that need to be tied yeah. up or whatever. Like I was just like, it's like yeah, like no one's talking about that. Well, I mean, people talk about, it, but I was like, I haven't seen videos on something like that yet. Like this was mm -hmm. plus like you know you branched out. Like you did like a like a Dawn of the Dead uh, like one that I I really like that one because I love both the original and the and the remake from Zack Snyder, which. I don't say that much about Zack Snyder's movies because he's a fucking whack job, but <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a really popular one, the Dawn of the Dead stuff, which I, which is cool. I like that. You never know, like in terms of when we're sort of like reaching outside of Resident Evil, you never know what's gonna land necessarily. But that that one's that one was good fun, and people seem to have taken to that one. Mm, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, if I remember correctly, you guys did like a like a Castlevania one too in, in, a while back, right? Yeah, when we were talking about doing stuff outside of resident evil well for one thing it was just like well if we're making a patreon um we want to offer something different and that's where all these kind of non-resident evil subjects have come from um and we'd been talking about castlevania since day one of that so it had to happen at some point so yeah we did a an episode where we kind of loosely tried to cover all of the series and i'm sure one day we'll probably go and sort of dip back into specific games because yeah we got we got some big castlevania fans across our entire team definitely that's that's pretty cool because like I mean Castlevania obviously is really hot right now because the anime just finished it, it its run and Castlevania's like you know been something a lot of people wanted back and Konami's just like hey we could probably give you a pachinko machine <laughs> oh god it still blows my mind that that series got made that they they greenlit the anime because they're not doing anything with any of their IPs but we've got a Castlevania anime it just confuses me I'm not I'm not happy that it exists I just don't get it yeah. Right? Like, that was something that I, like, I think blew everybody's mind when we first heard Castlevania anime coming to Netflix, and we were like, whoa? Right. <laughs> and then it happened. For, like, like you say, four seasons it's gone on so, so far. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, four Yeah, and there's, there were, like, murmurs of them doing a movie or something. Am I right in thinking that? Like, think they want to do a... Spin-offs, I think? Like, they want to, like, continue that world of Castlevania, but I guess, like, Trevor, Alucard, and uh, Cypher are, like, done as characters, but they want to, like, I... spin it off or something. I haven't quite finished the new season but yeah from what i understand it's like well there's a lot of other belmonts out there so yeah they should definitely do some other stuff whether that's spin-offs or movies or whatever definitely yeah i mean People like agree for more yeah i mean like i say like you know don't milk something just to milk it and have it be crap because i think that's one of the reasons why again i won't spoil because you, you didn't finish it yet but i think that's one of the reasons why castlevania as an anime works so well is because the each season was pretty short and mm they were able to keep it without dragging on and they have i mean they bring in so much from all the games that's the thing like i remember like a constant criticism was of how it's not like the games and i'm like have any of you ever actually played a castlevania game like they're kind of all over the place <laughs> like lore wise and history wise yeah, yeah. but uh I mean, there's yeah. lots of sore nods and they do i think what they do is basically do their own thing like a a horror story with Dracula, but they've made their own take on it by taking as much as they can in terms of like set dressing and character names and what they do for the actual show, and it works out beautifully. Way better than say, you know, the Resident Evil live action films. Um, said <laughs> 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 the bad words. Uh, <laughs> what live action films? <laughs> oh, God, I, just, I just spilled my mouth. I gotta drink some more Gatorade. Oh God. <laughs> mm. 
Oh, I gotta wash away the Paul W. Anderson taste. Oh god. Tastes like shame. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> um, god, I, I hate those movies so much. So, like, uh, I guess, um, you know, so we've talked about the channel, but, like, how did you guys form? Like, how did you guys, like, meet up to, like, do this? Because that, that, that's, like, always, like, an interesting story, I feel. Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, this is a weird one. Steve, do you sort of remember? Because I'm. I, I do. I do. One, so. oh, okay, right. So, Ancient History. So, I did a uh, YouTube series called Sci Reviews It, right? And they were doing Resident Evil games. Now, I have been known to be less than compassionate to Resident Evil Code Veronica, and I was on a kick. So, I, I discovered them on the, on the old YouTube, and I just reached out on Twitter. We must have been talking back and forth for a couple of months. Then RE2 gets announced, remake. And uh, I guess I support my bullshit for so long that, yeah, let's do, a, let's do a recording. And I think that was like the germination, the first aid spray, would you say, so si? Like the, the yeah. pre? There's a few uh, little, like, pre-first aid spray things out there that are kind of like indication of what was going to happen because yeah like i was i just i was aware you know that steve was a, a youtuber of his own he's got his own let's play channel and i was like okay cool I, we kind of met over twitter let's collaborate on something and we yeah we just recorded like an hour's worth of our reaction to re2 remake being revealed and it was the first time we'd spoken um like in a voice call or anything like that and we did a couple of other bits um I did a Resident Evil Gaiden <laughs> video review of all things, <laughs> where I dragged Steve on for that. Um, right. And then, and then, uh, I mean, the other one, the one that my my personal favorite one is the uh, the copy of RE2 for GameCube that's on my shelf with a personal handwritten message from Steve because <laughs> uh, that was missing from my collection. So it's things like that. And then eventually, I just messaged him one day and was like, I keep thinking about starting a Resident Evil podcast, but I don't know how. I don't know who. I know it's going to be y you ah. if you want to be on it. Um, where do I go from this? Either tell me to stop because it's a stupid idea or help. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's what you, you told me to try and talk you out of it. And then I went, well, why don't we just get like, you know, you know Jordan Sherwin <laughs> to give it a go? Yeah, uh, and that's that's kind of how it began. Like just a, a few other people that I'd sort of worked with in some capacity. Um, Adam and I were the um, admin team for the Resident Evil board game community. So that's how we met. Um, Sherwin is he works at Steamforge Games, who make the Resident Evil board games. So that's obviously we met in sort of the same place. Um, and Jordan was just another YouTuber that I worked with. And yeah, I just pulled them all onto a Discord and had a group conversation, kind of like laying out my ideas. So those earlier episodes of First Aid Spray are some of the first times that we've all spoken to each other. So I don't know how awkward they are to listen to now, but it's, it's funny because, yeah, we, we none of us were particularly well acquainted with each other, really. Not in a sort of like speaking to each other on a voice call sort of thing. So First Day Spray is funny like that. It's kind of like a chronicling of uh, this mad friendship over these two and a half years plus. Nice. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, you guys have really gone and uh, built something amazing with all, all, all everything you've got. Like, you've got a a lot of people, I mean, like, yeah, like, you got a lot of people on your team, and you're saying, like, who they are, you just said, like, who they are, and you're getting the shout-outs and stuff, and, like, again, like, it all, they all, from what I can tell, at least from when I listen to your podcast and stuff, like, everybody brings something to the table, and you've got, like, just a, a team, like, you know, like, you watch, like, some YouTubers, and, like, the, the YouTubers have their friends come by, and they're just like, oh, God, can this guy not be here in this episode, but, like, you guys are different, like, it's like, I, I like hearing everybody, so... Awesome. <laughs> that there's no black sheep. <laughs> Tony suddenly goes, but I don't like this guy. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know about this Steve guy. I'm not sure about him. Steve <laughs> comes out. <laughs> I, Steve, Steve speaks uh, my language. Like, I mean, like, because, like, Steve, you're kind of like the person who's more, like, you're the more, well, people would say negative, but I say you're more critical about things, I should say. I, it, it's, it tends to be, like, from, from what I tell when I listen back, is everyone else talks about, you know, the wider scope of things. I'm like, well, mechanically, this is this, this, and this. And I don't like this, <laughs> but I do like this. Also, uh, yeah, Chris looks pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I'm the uh, the blunt one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for one of the better term. Yeah. Uh, I know yeah, that role very you. well. <laughs> <laughs> you need that. You definitely need that. I like to think of it as concise, personally, but you can go with blunt if you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone definitely serves their own purpose and comes from it from different perspectives and stuff. Like, And that was absolutely the point from the beginning. Like, We talk about that in our first episode where it's like, 
at that point we were you know coming up to 20 23 years of resident evil obviously now 25 but the series is so massive and so many different things you got fans coming from everywhere and they like different things and you know showing only likes up to you know before resident evil 4 he's pretty much a purely a classic resident evil fan and some of our guys are a bit more casual steve and i are uh well in the trenches with it james is was brand new to the series uh, only a few years ago had never played any of the games on and we thought we'd br- bring him on and get that perspective so yeah it's a big smelting pot because there's, there's podcasts out there there's plenty of them that where everybody is like a super fan and that's cool but we wanted to offer something slightly different yeah, yeah that's, that's that's actually, actually I think something that you guys do really good with because uh, JJ said this like uh, like before like one of the, like, when we had the big review of uh, Resident Evil Village he's just like yeah Tony here is like the the least positive guy about this or he's got like some kind of opposites to say and he always says like that's a good thing to have because like if you have people that just agree with everything then you're just like you're just a bunch of yep man like yep 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 yeah. yep and it's fucking boring to listen to as well with everybody just saying yes <laughs> yeah you know. Like, I mean, yeah. like this podcast, I do not agree with the statement. However, I actually do. So let's just roll it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like that, that's like what you need. And like, that's why, like, you know, you guys do so well with your podcast and stuff, because you're just like, you know, it's like you have different people from different eras. Like us on the road, like all of us pretty much started with the first two games. Like, mm-hmm. like we're because like we're all a bunch of old farts and shit like that. So like we're literally like from the beginning, like, especially me, I got the game at like launch. I didn't know what it was. I just walked into a KB Toys one day. I saw Resident Evil, and the guy said it was new, and I got it. It was it came out that day, and so like you know, I've been there since the beginning. But it's always interesting to see like the fans that you meet along the way, then where they began the series, because obviously for twenty five years, this series has still been going strong for twenty five years. And uh, like a good friend of mine, she's she lives in England too. Uh, she and I are playing Resident Evil Five together on Saturday on stream, and she started the series with. Resident Evil 4 on the Wii. So she got the really fun version of RE4, in my mm-hmm. opinion. I love the Wii version. Oh my god, it's so good, right? Mercenaries is a blast on that. Yeah. Some people say it's too easy, but you know what? It's just more fun. That's the way I see it. It's I mean, just more fun. It's, if it is too easy, just plug in the GameCube controller and then you play it old school, right? You can okay, still do exactly, that with the Wii yeah. version. That's yeah, right, you can. Sure. That's t- I, I totally forgot about the... the well, yeah, it, depending if you have that Wii, because some later Wiis weren't built in with that function for some reason. Yeah, was that like the the Wii Mini or something? They released it really late, didn't they? Yeah, like it was like, like I think it was like a special Wii. edition, like one with like Mario or something, and like yeah, I remember it being red. So yeah, yeah. okay, so I'm Who not. The fuck's I'm not gonna, <laughs> I don't gonna buy a Wii Wii? Can't play GameCube games. Half the reason most people have a Wii is either a for Wii Sports if you're a grandma, or b to play Smash Brothers Brawl and get mad because it's not melee. You know, <laughs> this is why I like uh, this man. This is why I like him. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, like, I mean, so, yeah, like, have you guys, like, actually met in real life yet? Like, I mean, I don't know. I know England's kind of a big country and everything, but. <laughs> so, oh, people from America, it's, <laughs> it's really not, like, <laughs> people from America go crazy different, like, distances. And then people in the UK just go, nah, it's too far. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we were discussing it, weren't we? And then COVID. Like... Yeah, yeah, we were. Uh, like, there's literally in the sort of back room area of our Discord server, there's a, there's a channel still called Meetup, and nobody's spoken in it for like a year and a half because our plan was, yeah, to, to meet up in the middle of the country, go do something. Uh, obviously, at the time, we were talking about, hey, they're talking about a new Resident Evil film. Uh, maybe we should do that. I mean, it's topical, and obviously, that's coming out at the end of the year. I don't know if that'll still be able to happen, but yeah. Yeah, the the coronavirus hit, and so no, it's it's not really happened. And, you know, Steve and James know each other IRL, if you like, um, but nobody else on the team has has met so far. One day it'll happen. Oh, yeah, so we're just scattered around the UK, like looking at angles and getting upset as to why we can't we meet in Birmingham and see a rubbish film. Um, <laughs> oh my god, I love it. Um, like, that's gonna be great because I'm gonna tell you because like me and the Row guys, we met uh, in. Uh, 2020 before like the pandemic really hit like no one even knew like it hadn't even began yet I think or something but that was like one of the best moments in like the three four years we've had our channel was just everybody coming together meeting and like JJ uh and and Ali they were like Jesus Tony like you know like we didn't think you were this tall like I, I mean I'm only six one like freaking <laughs> Bob Spaghetti's like like six five and Corey's like six four and JJ like JJ's six feet I'm six one and Ali's like five nine five ten 
And then there's then you know we got we brought Nick with us, Nick Apostolidis, and he's standing next to us, and he was like he's like the shortest one out of us all, but he's like the most badass out of us all. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, everyone was just like, yeah, like, I didn't think like Tony was that tall, and then I think I think it was Corey or Bob who said, yeah, I didn't know Tony had eyes because I wasn't wearing my sunglasses. <laughs> Um, so when you guys like meet up, I get like, you're going to have like, it's just going to be like, you, you felt like you'd known each other, like your whole lives when you finally do meet up. And then you're, then you're going to be, when you all go, you're like, Oh God, I hope I never see these people again. <laughs> it's probably like the line. ugly character. Uh, you know, with Dylan, you son of a bitch. Um... <laughs> Yeah, there'll be a lot of that, definitely. Yeah, I, I can't wait. Make sure to take pictures, man. I want to see that, because like, I know a lot of the 100%. fans would love to see that, too. 100%. Yeah, I mean, of course, I've seen the, the road pictures of all you guys from that meetup, so I know exactly what you mean. And we'll, we'll yeah, we'll get very similar ones, just as soon as we can, I think. Yeah, I mean, like... Oh, with... no, I don't think we can beat Tony on the pulpit, because that, that always looks cool. <laughs> um, oh, that's right, the podium. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was me, my bid for presidency. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so like, house kick for the island, <laughs> I was just like, don't worry, I'm going to take care of America by putting a foot in every ass. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, Tony's the last person that should have access to nuclear weapons. I was like, oh yeah, I would snap like 18 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I guess um, I guess we should talk about like something like, you know, like you guys' uh, favorite Resident Evil games. Because again, this is like, a, a, you guys are a Resident Evil podcast and, and, and all it, what are some of your favorite games? Like, what was the like? What was the ones they actually started with? Like, what's what got you guys into it? So, hey, you know, I'm gonna give, give this to you to start. Oh, with. Right, okay, all right. I, I started <laughs> uh, right. So it's I don't know if it's launch year. It must be around that time. My brother has just got on a PlayStation, right? And we only have Ridge Racer and like Tekken. Uh, so we so we go to a rental shop and these these rental shops they didn't have the actual game case it's just the discs in like clear cases we see the original resident evil disc which is like just a fucking eye with the text like who the fuck is that steven i don't know let's give it a go uh, and then needless to say uh we spent the entirety of the weekend going through that game i can't even remember if we beat it initially but it was a rental and the yes the dog corridor did have an effect it did launch coffee up my brother's freshly plastered wall. So he had to completely redo his wall. It was, it was kind of funny. Fun times. <laughs> um, as for my favourite, like, when I... I think the first Resident Evil I bought was Director's Cut. Like, is in me for, for me to own. But I'm pretty sure it's RE2 because it's the only one I keep going back to year after year after year after year, you know. I know it's just something about that game. There's something about that game that's just fantastic. It's like, for me, it's the aliens of video games. I know that's a cliche to say, but everyone wants Citizen Kane now, nah, mate. Give me, you know, Leon going through the streets, getting beaten up by William Birkin with his giant metal pipe and eyeball, shoulder and claws any day of the week. It's fantastic. They, they really did do a lot with that game to like in terms of it's like it's advertisement and it's uh, just pretty much like if the original Resident Evil was considered a 10, like RE2 is considered like a freaking 12 by people because like it took everything you loved about the original and improved upon it. Oh man, yeah. I remember the lead up to it, and like even in the UK, we had like gaming magazines, like wall to wall. You would see nothing but that one picture of like it's. I think it's on the back of the old case. Where it was like a zombie in a body bag. Oh something. my god, that really creepy one. Yeah. Yeah. And and that was frigging like on like loads of magazine covers, and then you got like you know your weird comic book art versions of Leon and Claire, and and it's just like hype was high. Like even I was like when I went into my local supermarket on Mormon, I'm pretty sure this must have been launch day. And I just went, Mum, can I have that? It's a 15, Stephen. It's not scary, I promise. Uh, and then, yeah, <laughs> history was made. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, the 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 two two is de like not my favorite, but like it definitely, I think it's probably in my top five. And quite honestly, like the the impact that it had, like if two wasn't as successful as it was, I don't think the series would be where it is today. In many ways, mm. I feel. I mean, that's mm. just me personally, but. Yeah. No, no, yeah. I agree. It really sort of set the blueprint for a while, didn't it? Like, what you could do with with horror as well. Like, as you say, it's a massive step up. Um, it was just like, yeah, you thought this was good. How about everything turned up to 100? It's, it's yeah, it's my favorite as well. Like, I I make no attempts to hide that. It's, it's my favorite. It's, I mean, some of that maybe with nostalgia as well, because it's my first game for the series. Um, 
and I've tried to tell the story before. My memory is just terrible. That's like a recurring theme. <laughs> <laughs> when it's like, hey, when did you first play this game? I'm like, I don't know. It's just always been there. Um, and that's kind of like what it is for RE2. But the more I try and think about it, I feel like I'm piecing it together more and more because I had such a weird situation with it where I'd never heard of it before. And I think my parents probably bought me it. And I was not old enough to play it, but they didn't really care too much. And I was like, into, I was in that age where I was like into monsters and I was like doodling zombies just because like gore is fun to draw. And <laughs> I don't know. I was, yeah, uh, it, probably just about in double figures, to be honest. Just not, not even a teenager. Um, and they bought me it for the PlayStation. I just remembered like it being so hard that I couldn't sometimes i couldn't even get to fucking kendo's gun shop you know i just couldn't deal with the controls it was for a kid that grew up on sonic i was like what the hell is this i don't know what i'm doing <laughs> um, i think i put it down for a long time and then i got we were buying pc magazines like we had we'd buy the same magazine every month because it come with a cover mount demo disc and one of the demos was resident evil 2 and even though i had the game i was like oh, i want to try it on pc and that's when I started to make headway sometime later on PC, I'm pretty sure. And then I would go back to the PlayStation game with what I'd learned um, and eventually slowly start to make my way through it. And it's, yeah, it's it's just a series from there that I just kind of got obsessed with. Like, I remember going on early internet and looking at all the uh, Resident Evil fan sites to sort of discover what the other games in the series were and what they were going to be and look at all the, the monsters and all the weapons. I was just enthralled by the whole world of it. Um, and I followed it on and off. Um, and RE2, in a weird way, is one of, like the game that brought me back as well. Um, because I went through some like crappy times, sort of like 2011, maybe 2012. And it was one of those things where it was kind of like a nostalgic escape. I just remember, like, I'm going to lock myself away and play Resident Evil 2 again. And that's my main memory of it, is playing it then, weirdly. like And falling back in love with it and kind of being like oh yeah this series is so good and i just remember replaying everything around that time and then from there yeah just it started to grow and grow and grow like that's that's a really cool story because like you know like this is like the impact that two has on a bit like it's just it's presentation because you remember you play the original resident evil one and like you just start off in like the mansion like okay so i'm just getting used to controls i can do it no you jumping into re2 you're jumping into the like kitchen into the frying pan type stuff there's like six zombies on the street coming at you like, that was intense. Even for someone who played the original at launch, I was just like, wait, what? Whoa, 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 what? what? Oh, okay, we're doing this? Shit. Like, that was, like, the power of what 2 had. Plus, its storytelling was really good. The The voice acting was, like, a huge jump uh, in that game. And it really just did something. Like, and yeah, like, it really caused a lot of fan sites to pop up. I remember, like, all, like, the crazy ones that were, like, popping up everywhere. And, like, there was scans, like, from... Like, uh, people were, like, just using scanners and taking, like, magazines. And, like, you could see, like, the fold mm. in there and stuff like that from, like, Japan and stuff. And it really took the world by storm and, like, what they did with that game. And, uh, I mean, like, do, do you... I don't know, like, we all have games where we play them and they can take us back to a certain time. Like, we get the nostalgia feel, but then there's, like, we're talking back to the future type stuff where, like, you remember this happening. You remember this clearly. Like, for me... I can remember playing Resident Evil 3 for the first time, and every time I play it, I still get brought back to that time period playing with my friends. Is that like how it works for RE2 with you? Yeah, it's like a time capsule. You, 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 you're a kid again, or I guess, in size case, you're you're early 20-something teen again. Uh, yeah, I, I, I tell you something that I, uh, I I tend to talk about a lot with my friends is you look at Capcom games and their sequels, and RE2 is a bit of an outlier because, uh, you know, Resident Evil 1's pretty good. Resident Evil 2 is fantastic. Mm, very, yes. Street Fighter 1, like, me, me and you are both like, big Street Fighter fans, Tony, but yep. I think we can both we can both agree Street Fighter 1 is complete dire dog shit. Oh, my Street God, Fighter yeah. Street 2 is fantastic. Yeah. You know? you... So, oh, God, yeah. I agree 100%. <laughs> so for a Capcom sequel to go ahead and, like, be not only better than the original, but significantly so, like, enough for RE2, and it doesn't have, like, the stepping stone of the previous game being even bad, I think is a, you know, a, a great thing. You know, to be able to build off the foundation of it, um, uh, and it's it's still with me now. Like I, I still have a pile of magazines in my mum's home about the development of RE2. You know, with like teasers for 1.5, which we never got, mm. and it, it it will always drag me back to when I'm like you know a wee nipper, too young to play the fucking thing. 
uh, amazing game. It really is. Yeah, like, it just, it just, it, just it, does so much. It's so funny that we recently put out um, a conversation Steve and I had about the music. Like, I could see us talking about his favorite music in the game. Um, because it's one of my favorite soundtracks as well, but I, I, sometimes when I think, try and think about earliest memories of RE2, I remember being so scared that I would play it with the sound off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that, that's acceptable. I, I, that, that, that game back then, you know, kids today are like, how is this ever scary? Because we've never seen anything like this in a video game. Right. No, exactly that. I didn't know what it was, and it was the not knowing, you know, like the hearing the William Birkin, like, roar that he does sometimes and not and it's like off screen like you're having yeah. a conversation with sherry and then you hear it and i'm like i don't want to know what that is i don't like in fact i don't even want to hear it so certain certain places in the game i'll just turn the sound off <laughs> it's so funny to think about now but yeah it was it was crazy that's ah, it's not, yeah like it's true like the, the music is great i actually just ordered the uh, the vinyl record for re2 the original re2 uh because if you haven't uh, i think you could get them on Amazon still from Capcom Sound Team, uh, and I would I would advise to do so because those things sell out quick and people were scalping RE2 for like two hundred dollars. I'm like, it's a fucking vinyl record, you pricks! For the love of God, don't be like this. Uh, I, have, I have a huge thing against scalpers, but uh, I just I, I I think that RE2 does have the best soundtrack. Again, it's not my favorite in the series as a game, but like the soundtrack is just legendary and then like hearing it again like in the dark side chronicles which uh i know like a lot of people do not like the dark side chronicles <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about yeah yeah we still gotta fight about that uh <laughs> but yeah like it too just has like I, I think two has the most fitting music for the series because everywhere you go you just feel that the music works for the area that's supposed to be I'm not saying that, like that one and three dozen or code veronica doesn't like they do good jobs at what they do but you just feel, this is, like, the perfect fit. Like, this is just, like, there's no flaw to it. They, it just works. Yeah. Soundtrack's so strong, but even on the remake, it works in, uh, like, almost flawless unison when you switch over to the classic mode, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I did that myself. Yeah, I was like, you know what? Like, I'm sure the, the soundtrack for RE2 remake is going to be good, but I have to play the old school soundtrack. And then I heard a lot of people saying that the soundtrack for re2 remake was actually kind of crappy and i was just like well i'm gonna have to listen to that at one point because i, I just because you want to take people's like you know personal like face value type deal but you also gotta be like well are you one of those people who like are so obsessed with something that you can't see the good when a remake comes out and you're just like a purist or whatever like you can't mm. you won't give it any credit you're just saying it's a piece of crap you know like i mean i i like i said i admit that re3 remake has a lot of issues but I still love a lot about it. But I'm not going to sit here and say that there's, it's flawless like other people have said. And yeah, just, that's fair. And with RE2 remake soundtrack, like, definitely play it with the, the soundtrack that it is intended. And that's where you'll get understand some of the complaints, I think. I think the actual music they made for it is pretty good. It just doesn't really get used right kind of like like you were saying re2 classic the music fits so perfectly it's just not really there as much in remake it's yeah it I mean, works we're... but it's not the same i mean talking three make you know everyone criticizes three make for things but i would argue like one presentation of the cutscenes, fantastic the way they wrote the, oh, yeah. wrote the story fantastic and the way they implemented the music fantastic it's like completely like the inverse of re2 remake where the soundtrack's kind of subtle in two make in three make, it's pretty much there the entire time as like a presence, and I think that helps it a lot. Like you know, I'm one of the people who will turn around and say, three make may not may not be perfect, but it is a fun time, like a roller coaster. I can agree with that. I, I definitely respect that. Hmm. Just kind of wish they used Nemi a bit more. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, God, like he was just uh, just a placeholder, man. Like I felt like this. Like, like no wonder they didn't call it Resident Evil Three Nemesis because he was barely in it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. like, I, Resident Evil 3 Carlos <laughs> I mean I like see Resident Evil 3 is my favorite Resident Evil of all time so to see the game get done like it did it really did hurt but I did love a lot of the things they did I think like the acting in it is phenomenal I think Jeff Shine as Carlos is like literally the best thing about that. I mean Nicole Tompkins is amazing as Jill I think she is exactly who Jill Valentine is supposed to be and kind of like what they did with uh, the original Carlos and like kind of how it came into RE3 Carlos, I felt that both are great. 
Because I've, uh, I've talked to both the actors, and they're both phenomenal people. And just, you know, you, you, you get scared when you hear the word remake. And you, you're hoping that they understand and they know what to do. And from what we found out from, like, the actors, like, they, they just love this shit. And they understood that this is a big thing. And the, and the people directing it and writing it, they understand that it's a big thing. And I, I really think we can all agree that the acting is some of the best thing to come out of the Resident Evil games. In fact, like, one of, the, one of my criticisms about RE2 Remake is that there's not enough cutscenes. Because, you know, Nick as Leon and Stephanie as, as Claire, they just did so good on screen. I'm like, no, I want more. I don't need Metal Gear Solid level stuff, but I want, like, cutscenes the length of, like, Resident Evil 5 and 6. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You must be pretty excited for Infinite Darkness then since they get to come back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You have no idea. Like, when Nick first announced that, I, I, I texted him and I was like, dude, I, I am so happy they brought you back, man. I'm proud of you, dude. Like, I'm, I'm happy you get to be the guy you love to be again. Like, cause I mean, I mean, did you guys ever interview Nick or anything or? No, we haven't really done much of the voice actor thing, to be honest. I know a lot of other people do it and they do it really well. I'd just be concerned that we'd be asking the same questions, but I guess never say never. I mean, yeah, dude, never say never. Cause like Nick, he, he loves that stuff. Sarah Coates, uh, who we've had on our podcast like twice. Uh, I think she was on three or four times like, when we had the big row convention we had like a bunch of the other actors from various uh, game, from their respective games on it each time but um sarah loves doing interviews she loves talking horror she loves video games uh we talked about that on the podcast last night so reach out to her dude and everything you know like and reach out to like nick and the others like it's a fun time with them but you know like nick is a massive fan i mean if you've heard any like podcasts with him he'll tell you like he grew up playing re2 so much and that he loved it and he did whatever he could to get this role and he just and it was the right choice like he like because I, I, I saw some people saying it's like well nick is good as young leon but how is he at you know being an older leon like like what leon becomes later on and i was like guys like i know the guy i've seen his reels like you know like we know what he can do he's an actor he's gonna do just fine and i think infinite darkness does prove that like you know He's got the range of Leon that we need. Because, I mean, like, yeah, we had so many different Leons. And that's, again, where I think Leon himself comes into play as a, as a character. They always find the actors who are just right for the role. I don't think Leon has ever been miscast before, in my opinion. Everybody's always... agree. Yeah. I think, like, everybody that's always done him has done a good job. I know, like, a lot of people were upset when Matt Mercer only got to do, like... I think, like, two versions of Leon, because people really liked him. Paul Haddad had done it for a couple times. People, I don't know, like once, and people loved Paul. And then Paul Mercier, like, people loved his, like, you know, definitive RE4 uh, Leon. But I think Nick is the right choice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, so I'm really if, excited to see. I'm, yeah. Uh, go on, Sai, sorry. No, I just going to say I'm really excited to see his sort of, like, take on a bit more grown-up, moodier Leon. I know he's got it in, in him. And, like you say, as a fan... Uh, like him, him being a fan of the series, I've got full confidence that he'll pull it off. I'm, I'm just waiting for. I, we all know four make is a thing, right? So I, I want to hear, you know, action here, action hero, cool Leon from, from you know, um, from Nick because I have a feeling he's gonna have a lot of fun with that. Mm. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah, definitely love the character. Yeah, I mean, like, like Nick's in fucking shape. Like he's fucking jacked and everything like that, and he. Like, he's very physical at what he can do. Like, when he gets into a project, he I mean, like, this guy is, he's artistic. Like, the art that he does, I don't know if you guys have ever seen his art. Have you? sketch work stuff, yeah. Oh, my God. Like, and that, not even just that, his wood-burning stuff. Like, he's just got the eye for it. And he's, like, a man of many talents. And that's why I, I can't wait to see what he does in future. Because it looks like Capcom is keeping the actors we do have currently. Because, I mean, they've been reusing them for, you know, like, like the, all the other games. A lot of them came back for Village. So, mm -hmm. um, I wonder yeah. if that's like pandemic related, to be honest. But I can't complain necessarily that they're clinging on to these actors because they're all gold, and it's it's a good thing because like the series is in a really good place right now, mm. and it helps that you've got these voice actors that are engaged with the community and that can can continue to be engaged with the community because they are being recast and stuff. I mean, um, Nick... That can, that can only be a good thing. Yeah, Nick and Stephanie can't get any more into the community because they literally cosplay the characters they voice in motion capture. I love that. Like, that, that was just, like, when, like when you know, like, when Nick was saying he was making his own, like, Leon uh, outfit, and there was a... It was a photo of him, like, making the knife, and I, I, I was just, like... I texted him, I was like, Nick, that, that picture of you making the knife, 
that's like straight out of Rambo. That was awesome. He's like, actually, that was my uh, that's my inspiration for the photo. I'm like, fucking right, man. Let's go. <laughs> and uh, like that, that's the thing. Like when you see the actors just like get into it. I mean, like other voice actors out there have, have done the same thing. Uh, Aerith, voice actor from Five Minutes Seven Remake, she actually went got the dress made by Lady Zero up in Canada, a very famous uh, Canadian cosplayer. And she just nailed, like, the dress looked beautiful, like, it was, it was a great, like, they got a good photographer to do uh, the photos, and I think I've, who else have I seen that has done, I, I know I've seen other uh, act, voice actors do their characters and stuff, but uh, you gotta love and respect that. I think that's why that, whoever handles the casting in the future has to understand why these characters are loved, and why these actors are loved, because they give a damn. It's not just another job for them, they have become so enthralled in these characters you know like um it's just it, they need to stay for those long because like japan has this thing with voice actors where their voice actors voice the same character for like 30 years like goku's voice actress in in japan she has literally been doing it since dragon ball and that's like 35 years now i think yeah my, oh yeah mask on yep. oh, yeah she's done it and like you look at a lot of the tekken voice actors and uh, a lot of Street Fighter voice actors in Japan, too, and, like, it's just, like, voice actors in general for a lot of characters, they voice them for, like, fucking decades, man. Until, like, they pass away, or, like, the few times they do recast them. Like, Japan just has this thing about... I, I think, like, they really respect the actors that do the role. I think there's, like, a whole, like, really, like, level of respect where in America, they seem to just recast them for stupid reasons, or... Sometimes in America, too, like, you know, it's like, the actor can't be... They're on another project and can't do this one. And because voice acting now, they have the voice actors do the mocap. That's where things get a little bit more hectic. I feel. So the only, I think the only RE engine uh, recasting I've had so far is Chris, right? Uh, it, like it was David Vaughn, and it's now Jeff Shine. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Because Chris is the only technically returning character with the re engine i feel mm. um mm. Wait, I, I mean there's there's, there's yeah. like you know mia and ethan but like uh, yeah they've only been in like seven and eight haven't they yeah it's same with sort of like marvin you know you breathe appearance in in remake three but but yeah in terms of the major thing chris you gotta wonder if that's to do with sort of the backlash or like i say just the pandemic where it was like well we can't necessarily fly him over here to do it uh and jeff shine's already here so i don't know maybe it's a combination you can say yeah. Resident Evil 9, David Vaughn, Chris rocks up, and then we're all just fucking confused. <laughs> it's literally going to be like that Spider-Man meme, like, where they're all pointing at each other. <laughs> You're going to have all of them, and then, like, you get Ruben Langdon, who was, he's, like, for people who don't know, Ruben Langdon was the motion capture for Chris Redfield from, sorry, from Resident Evil Code Veronica, all the way up to, I think, like, RE, yeah, RE6. Mm-hmm. Or was he in Vendetta? I don't, I don't think he did Vendetta's. He was, he was in Vendetta, wasn't he? Is the body? No? Well, I, I want to say maybe, because um, Kevin Dorman was the voice. I don't think he did the motion capture. So maybe that was the last time he did uh, motion capture for Chris was uh, Vendetta. Because mm. Ruben, he was like that for years. And like I, I think, he, yeah, he did try out for, I think he said he tried out for Chris in RE5 when we interviewed him a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. But he didn't, he didn't get it. And I'm just like, damn, that would have... Oh, that would have been awesome, man. Because, I mean, you know, he's Ken Masters in Street Fighter. He's Dante from Devil May Cry. Like, adding Chris to your resume of, like, just not even just being, like, the motion capture, but the voice, that's amazing. Cause that's amazing. But that's what they do now. Like, they hire mainly the actor and for voice and mocap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, um, the Kevin Dorman thing, like, extra special on that is that they used his voice in an RE5 trailer. Like, he was the placeholder for Chris until they nailed it down. So he was so close, like to being Chris all that time back then, until they obviously changed it to Roger Craig Smith. Was and he live was action, nice. Chris? You know those uh, Juju trailers where he's like having quote unquote PTSD. Oh yeah, like they had the, the, the PTSD, like those live action ones. Yeah, yeah he was he like, I don't remember. Hmm. Weird thinking about Chris having PTSD after RE Five now, but that's uh, that's by the by, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I got some problems. <laughs> That's actually uh, that's actually a fucking damn good question. That now I, I gotta look that up later because I gotta figure that out. But yeah, I, I did forget that he was um, uh, what do you call it there? Like they did use him as the placeholder in the original because like he had a because mm-hmm. everybody thought like that was like Billy at first until it said like Chris Redfield on the screen. So everyone's like, oh okay, hey, this is we're, we're doing this then. <laughs> um, oh yeah, Kevin was also the uh, the motion capture for Piers as well. Yes, I totally forgot about that. It just popped into my mind. Yeah, strange, isn't it? Really, yeah. these this person that's been all these different characters and 
different times. And oh wait a minute, yeah, I, I'm also forgetting too. Umbrella Chronicles. He was Leon, I think. No, he was he was uh he uh, Kevin Dorman was Leon. Uh, no, no, uh, was Chris in the Umbrella Chronicle game? Yeah. I t- mm. wow, like man, like the- see, this is why we like we need to have like uh, Sunny on here, Sunny Bauer, because like he's just like it's like Sunny. Can we crack open your brain and can we read like what's in your mind right now? Because like we know that you remembered everything. <laughs> That guy yeah, is Johnny, can you tell us the uh, can you tell us the inner details of why you love Billy Cohen quite so much? <laughs> yeah. uh, see, that's a that's a RE fan community thing that we all know he absolutely despises. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I, I, I love I, I love a tweet that Sonny put out the other day. It was uh oh it was he's uh, it was like so why like I'm getting like I'm not a lot of new followers, like why do you guys really enjoy like how did you find like what was it? And I, my simple question being me as the jackass I am, I was just like you appreciate a good hat. Because <laughs> he, he's like me. He has like a very iconic hat and everything. So That's, um, You guys got trademarks. You that's got, right, yeah. You know, we do. Noticeable trademarks. I love that. Um, I remember like, because I, I was a couple months ago, I, I was filming uh, in the state that he lives in. And he was just like, why are you in my state? And all of a sudden, and why... Are you worrying about donuts and not getting pizza from my state? And I'm just like <laughs> conversation. <laughs> and I was like, look, man, I had to get up at friggin' three o'clock in the morning to film for like 14 hours. I just wanted a goddamn lemon donut, and for some reason, Jersey doesn't want me to have a goddamn lemon donut because the lemon donut they did give me was fucking cream filled, and I almost gagged on that shit. <laughs> and then I, I took his advice and I went and got pizza after filming for like 14 hours, <laughs> which he was right. It was good. It was good. Next time I'm, I'm over East now. Coast, I'll uh, I need to hook up with both of you. Say hi. I mean, like it's one day that'll happen. We're not like tech. I think like we're like five hours like from each other or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's technically not that too far. And like, if you want to like go to a place where like really good pizza, like we could probably all meet in New York City because you know Josh the medic, he lives there as well. Right. Well, I mean, yeah. If anyone says you should maybe go to New York City, I'm gonna jump on that because uh, everybody knows. Full well how much I enjoyed it the first time I was there. I mean, I'd fucking live there if I could. So, yeah, but nobody, nobody can, can afford, afford that. that. No, <laughs> God no. I mean, you gotta you gotta be paying like you know six thousand dollars a month for a one bedroom apartment, and then that's it. Like your bedroom is the apartment. <laughs> I yeah. So what I'm saying is, if people want to make my dreams come true, the Patreon for First Aid Spray is. <laughs> I mean, fuck! I I donate money to that to get you guys in. Because <laughs> uh, like I mean like New York does have like a huge like group of like Resident Evil like people like I said Josh the medics there and I love that goofy <laughs> motherfucker like I torment the hell out of him like uh, when I was in New York uh, uh, like a couple weeks ago doing photos I messaged him and I was like yeah dude uh, I'm in New York City come get me I'm scared come pick me up <laughs> and he's and he's like oh my god Tony like you know that I'm in Salem right now like I can't and I'm just like yeah you go to my state when I'm not there and I go to your state when you're not here you're a bitch. And he's like, oh my god, Tony, I love you so much. Stop. No, I, 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 I do love seeing the, the friendships of the RE community. When you follow the right people, you get to see all these kind of crazy interactions. I love it. Oh my god, dude! Like when, uh, like when I was in Anime New York 2019, like he was, uh, he was, he, no, he wasn't going to the con that year because he had, uh, so like, uh, someone from out of town was coming. I can't remember who he was saying, but he's, I was just like, oh. Oh, yeah, I see. Someone coming to my town and forget your friends. That's how it is, huh? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I see. Yeah. But he was actually near where my hotel was. So he couldn't find the hotel because the hotel's like in this weird area in like Midtown. So I see him out in the street. I'm there. So I'm like starting to like creep up on him and shit like that. And I just shoulder check him into 7th Avenue. <laughs> uh, like I, I abuse that motherfucker so much and he loves it. <laughs> That's what it's all about, though. You see, like, you, there's, like, several different, like, subsects of the RE community, and there's the ones that have fun, the ones that laugh, and just, and, and then there's the ones that maybe, maybe get a little too upset about the wrong things and don't just know how to let it slide and have fun, and that's, that, that, that's, uh, that's probably why we like hanging out with each other, I think, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's uh, like, we all just, like, want to have fun with, like, the thing we do, and, um, I mean, like, we, I guess we could talk a little bit about that. Like, we've seen how fandoms can be, like, how bad they can be, and, you know, I think... I'm not saying, like, we have, like, a click or anything like that, but I think a lot of the people that are in, when it comes to, like, Crimson Head and First Aid Spray and, you know, and Row, I, I think that, like, a lot of the fans generally get along with everybody. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, all the cosplayers that I've talked to and met and got to work with and hopefully to work with in the future and, like, you know, like, meeting you guys, like, this is, like, what communities are all about. It's not about one-upping one another. It's not about 
using each other and backstabbing each other. It's about helping people grow on a platform that's really hard to grow on. Or anything. Yeah. You know, that's why, why I love connecting with the community because everybody's just so great. You know, like I don't care about popular. This is why I'm not more popular in the cosplay world for community because I don't kiss ass and shit. I'm just like, I don't care if you got five followers or five hundred thousand. You need photos. I'm gonna do photos for you. I don't care how famous you are or how how you're not. You need photos. You come to me, and that's I guess like another thing people really like me for is that I'm very blunt. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Respect, isn't it? Um, yeah. And then, and then Jennifer, you, just, you you got to be respectful to each other. You can all have fun, have a laugh, know each other's boundaries, and don't take the piss. Like, uh, I don't know. It's just sometimes these days, some people pick fights, and it really gets on my nerves. Oh yeah, they have a stupid shit. Oh yeah. god, yeah. Oh yeah. Like, I mean, it just. I mean, do you guys remember like years ago how bad it got? Like when like when people who got introduced to Resident Evil Four like, first, wouldn't play the originals because of how bad the controls were. Like, they were saying, like, all these horrible things. Like they, It's just like, look, you haven't even played it. You can't judge it. You haven't played it. Like, give it a shot. And then that, that changed when Resident Evil Remastered came out on PS3, PS4 because it had the analog option. That I think Resident Evil 2 on the N64 had that option, if I remember correctly. Um, but, yeah, like, a lot of people were so anti-original RE. And I, I will admit there were a lot of original RE people that hated 4, 5, and 6 and shit on people who enjoyed those. And I was just like, this isn't the way to be. No, 100%. That's, as I said, that's kind of our MO. It's just like, so it resonated with so many different things. You like what you like, you don't like what you don't like. I mean, doesn't mean we have to argue and hate each other over it. Not in the yeah. slightest. I mean, speaking of new Resi fans, I actually had a really cu- a, uh, cute exchange the other day in my uh, my day job. Oh. So obviously Village had just come out, right? Um, and they started with the Resident Evil Seven, and they and I, uh, I shit you not, the, the question was, Steve, I, I know you do this Resident Evil podcast thing. Uh, why is Chris such a big deal? And my face just dropped. I went, Oh <laughs> boy, have I, I have got things to show you. Like uh, there are people jumping on, and it's you know it's, it's a good thing to see when people are like, enthusiastic to know more. Mm-hmm. I wish people would be less gatekeeping more. Yeah, this is so. This is what happened there, and then ah, uh, I don't know. It's just it's good to see people jump on, and I hope people don't poo poo them out of it because they join on at a late stage. Mm-hmm. Um, We're all old farts now, so <laughs> we have to sort of embrace the new community. We have to have to show them the way and say, "This is all the games. Pick what you like. Try this. Try that." You know, it's, it's what it's all about. And we we constantly see new people coming in, and people sort of who have been fans for a long time who feel more comfortable being a part of the community now than they would have been years ago because it seems to have lightened up a little bit. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Specifically, like, there was a conversation not too long ago about how there's more women in the community now than there has been before because they feel more comfortable with it, um, which is good. Obviously, I don't know what the problem was before, but I'm glad whatever it was seems to have been resolved, and I'm glad to see such a diverse set of people, all Resident Evil fans, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, the when you really look at how Resident Evil has evolved, we are technically now even... Because of how gaming has evolved. Because, like, when, when Resident Evil came out, gaming was kind of one of those things that you... You didn't really tell people. Or if you did, people were like, oh, you play video games? But now it's, like, the biggest form of entertainment on the planet. And... Yeah. You know, there's a specific moment that always comes to mind for me. Oh? Not to cut you off. No, no, go for it, dude. I remember, and I'm sure... 99% of people out there listening to this can relate to this. I remember being bullied for being a video game fan and growing up. Oh, yeah. Yep. And then Halo 2 came out, and it's like it's launch day. It's the high and gro- highest grossing piece of media ever made. And I'm standing there. Also, as a Halo fan, I was like, hell yeah, it's Halo 2. But I'm like, why the hell did I go through all that bullying for Halo 2 to be the most... Like, how does that make sense? <laughs> and obviously, that's like, whoa... 17 years ago now so you know that's quite a dated like, reference but it was a big deal at the time i feel like we're unpacking some baggage here um <laughs> <laughs> so, honestly, with gaming and bullying i think yeah if anyone was like a slightly more into the nerdier pursuits that they uh like you know i mean D books video games and all that uh people would be shitheads to one another let's be let's mm-hmm. let's not be around the bush and yeah as gaming has become more and more mainstream 
I think. Uh, and a lot of people will criticize it because, it, it, you know, it, it makes things all casual and all that. But um, the more people we can get in and, you know, generally, like, show how things are, introduce and make them feel comfortable, the better. I, I, I mean, there's always going to be places for where people want to exclude others. And I don't know if that's a good idea. Uh, it, I mean, Resi, is, it's, as it stands, 25 years old, is like one of the longest running, still successful, not dead game franchises we've seen in you know, so long now. Mm. Like, you know, you look at Sonic the Hedgehog, I mean, no offense to Sonic, but it, the middling, I think, would be a generous way of putting it. <laughs> you know, mm. and you look at every other survival horror franchise bar Resi now. And like what, fucking what hell. The survival horror yeah. franchise. Yeah, they're all dead. It's true. Uh, like Resident, Resident Evil's like that, like that thing when uh, it was in Splinter Cell, where it's just like, oh, yeah, like you know, Sam Fisher's like listening to a tale about like it's clearly Solid Snake that they're talking about. And it's like, yeah, I heard he retired, and he's just like, I'm the only one left. Yeah. <laughs> That's like what Resident Evil's kind of now. feeling like. Um. So yeah, letting people in when they walk in from any point during this timeline, I think, is a great thing as long as we can, like you know, just all reach a common ground. I know some folks are always going to prefer to fix cameras, some folks are going to prefer over the shoulder, and some people prefer first person. It's all the same universe, just playing what you love. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, I, I admit, like, you know, at the beginning I was not happy with the big change that we had gotten, you know, from, uh, you know, first, uh, you know, uh, fixed camera angles to third over the shoulder view, and, mm -hmm. you know, like, that, it, it bugs me. Like, I never, like, I never hated it completely, like, to where I would tell people that they have to hate it too. I was just disappointed because, you know, you grew up playing Resident Evil 1, 2, 3, Code Veronica, Remake, Zero. It's something that you're used to, and change is just, uh, like, it, it, like you know, when you have... Because at that point, like, that was around, like, from 96 to, like, 2004, like, there was all fixed camera angles, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not there with you. I was exactly the same. Yeah, like, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we're not grumpy old people who don't like change. We are. That's fine. <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, if Capcom, I'm not, if you listen to this, you know, fixed camera game, we, we'd buy it. We would. You know, you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Sometimes we will just go fix cameras. Go for it. You know, treat yourself. I'll buy uh, it three fucking times. Yeah. <laughs> oh, same. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, but it's just a case of uh, it's when folks like say someone jumps on over the shoulder, like. People shouldn't look down on them for it or whatever. I think that's what I'm trying to get at. I know I'm a, I have a particular way of speaking, and it's mostly confusing the fuck out of people, especially <laughs> myself. So, uh, but again, change is rough, and adapting with that change is always a challenge. Not not going to poo-poo that one bit. Yeah, no, it, it, it's understandable. Like, you know, because we're at this crossroad now where there's now a new set of Resident Evil like fans coming in because seven and eight. Seven was got like, that push for VR, and then like with Village, it's a whole new, it's all first person now. So we're getting because like I said earlier, gaming has changed in a platform to where everybody's playing it now. That we're gonna get more new people in because hype for these things build because media is a lot different than it was when Resident Evil Four came out, and then it was very different from when Resident Evil uh, One came out back in '96. So you know we've. As, as the older pioneers, I guess you'd say, of like the Resident Evil community, we gotta like show people why the, the classics are amazing without turning them off to it, like without being uh, what was the word? Yeah, like gatekeepers or whatever. Like you know, like yeah. we can't we can't shun people. We gotta educate them because I tried for years to educate people who would only play RE four, five, and six and didn't want to play the originals. Like they would like and they, these people. I was like, look, like, like I'm not saying you just try it out. Like, you, you can get, like, some of you still have your PlayStation 3, right? You're playing Resident Evil Remastered on there. Like, you said you love that. And that was the thing. When Remastered came out, all the naysayers played it and were just like, holy shit, this is, this is good. Like, this is really good. Because, I mean, let's face it, Resident Evil Remake holds up even after all these years. I think, isn't it because that sold so well, it kind of pushed Remake 2 in the direction? I mean, obviously, Remake 2 isn't fixed camera, but it's the reason... Oh, wait, they actually do like the remakes. Cause I think GameCube I've... didn't sell well, did it? If I remember right, GameCube RE1 uh, did not sell. I mean, we all know it's a great game. Oh, yeah, but... yeah. Uh, no, um, the GameCube, unfortunately, was, like, Nintendo's, like, a, another, like, step in their downfall at the time. Uh, the N64, as much as I love the N64, that was in trouble for the long time that it was around. Like, people don't understand that. But GameCube really suffered because they didn't really work to push it. They just figured, oh, we're Nintendo. People aren't going to buy what we tell them to buy because we're Nintendo. Like, they're still riding the high from, like, 
you know, the console, like, the, the bring, saving video games with the NES, and then the console wars of the 90s with Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, and, you know, they were so happy with the N64, because when consoles, at least back in the day, when consoles didn't do sell well, companies really went to other companies to pump out a lot of classics, and that's what I think they did with the GameCube. They really needed something to sell on there, and... Unfortunately, nobody was buying a GameCube, so the original remake and Zero did sell poorly. And Four had the advertisement kind of in, in the same way vein that uh, RE2 originally had, and that's like what got people to want to buy a GameCube. And then they're like, "Shit, people still not buying GameCubes that much, but we need to milk this game." So that's why they, you know, they brought it to PS2, and Shinji Mikami got pissed because he made it for the GameCube, and it was a uh, you know inferior port. Uh, mm-hmm. And then you know, so that was the thing, like. They decided to remaster it, and it broke all kinds of sales. On, like, I don't know about the Xbox, but it broke sales on PSN. Like, it set records that I don't think have been beaten yet at the t- uh, for that era. Um, that was just like six, seven that years ago. Right. Yeah, oh, man. Oh, no. What? Is that gray hair I can see? Oh, fuck. Um, yeah, God. When you say that, though, like, time's fucking evaporated. Jesus. I, I mean... I mean, RE7, that's 2017, right? Or is it 2016? 2017? 2017, yeah. January 2017. Christ. Oh, yeah, God. Over four years since the, the first-person perspective shift. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> and it doesn't, oh, seem like, it doesn't seem like 7 came out that long ago either. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty terrible like that. But on the plus side, it does mean that like new games get here a lot quicker because time's just zipping by. Like We'll have Resident Evil 9 before you know it, don't worry. You're gonna wake We're up so tomorrow. Right. It's okay. gonna be there. It's gonna be like, oh, it's just, just announced Resident Evil Nine. It's like, wait, what? Wait, how long was I asleep for? It'll come to you tomorrow, and you'll be like, I don't remember pre-ordering this, but okay. I was like, well, apparently I did, and unless they have access to my bank account, because it did say I pre-ordered it, that I have no record of. Wait, what? It's Capcom. It's, it's, it's Capcom, Tony. They have access to your bank account. Well, let's be fair. Let's be fair. I, you know. <laughs> to, to be fair, I'm the guy who owns three versions of like Resident Evil Two on the N64, so. <laughs> oh. Oh man, that's the one that I need as well. That's my missing port. So hard to get the N64 version. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean... at least in power, it goes for like hundreds of pounds. Wow. Yeah, wow. but the... wow. Tony does like this, like flea market stuff, and goes to like all the stalls and things, and like this battles with people. Yeah, this is true. That's well, I mean, yeah, like I mean, I've been doing, I've been collecting video games for ever since I was a little kid. Like I just would buy the games, I would never trade anything, and I did trade some way that I do have, like, regrets, I'll probably do a top five video on that at one point, but, um, Resident Evil 2, I did get on the N64 years and years and years ago, I did get it then, and I was so happy to get it because I had rented it, and it was really fun, and then I eventually bought it, and then, uh, I wanted to get, uh, what was it, I, I, uh, no, sorry, that one was stolen from me, that was one of the games that got stolen from me, I forgot. Because, uh, like, when you let people borrow things, they say, oh, I returned it. No, you fucking didn't. Um, and what happened was I was up late. I was, like, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. I wasn't sleeping. And I saw Resident Evil 2 on uh, eBay and Amazon. So I'm, like, okay, you know what? I'm going to buy one of these. So I bought one. I went downstairs, uh, got got some water, came back upstairs, and was uh, working on photos for the rest of the night. And the next, like, a couple days go by, and Resident Evil 2 for the, for the N64 comes to my house from ebay and i was like oh cool and then the next day all of a sudden there's another package and i'm like what it's from amazon and i'm like why do i have another resident Evil 2? i'm like oh son of a bitch like it's slowly done i mean i was so tired i forgot i pre-ordered i, I not pre-ordered i bought the first re2 on n64 on ebay and i bought the other one on amazon when i came back up from getting one i was so tired i didn't realize what i had done and oh, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll buy one off you. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know if it'll work, but I mean, I, I can probably send you one because here's here's the funny part. This is where the whole like story comes full circle. Buddy of mine is like, he calls me. He's like, yeah, Tony, I'm down at the toy vault. They got Resident Evil Two here in the N64. Do you need that? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> it, it was like it was like fifteen bucks then. It was like twenty on eBay and like I think like Amazon was selling for like eleven or something. So I don't know what they're going for now because I don't know if you guys know, but in America. Resident Evil games are stupid expensive right now. Yeah, I don't think it's really any different here in terms of like the the classics. Like if you wanted to buy them in good condition, some of them I imagine are quite hard to find now. 
Oh, yeah. Like, I was... I mean, I, I just... When I went to New York to do photos, I stopped at a retro game store that my friends talked about, and I bought Castlevania Symphony of the Night for 150 bucks. Um, Jeez. No, well, uh, yeah, no, I don't know about pain. I, I, I had to yeah. because that thing's going to go up in price. It's been jumping in price, and... Uh, I saw Resident Evil Survivor in the glass case for ninety dollars. Survivor people. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean that, that, again, that doesn't surprise me because like no. Survivor, you can't play that anywhere else yeah, except the PS One. So yeah, but that's like the American version, so you can't even use a fucking light gun with it. No, you can't. <laughs> that's like, true. God. Yeah, you know you you cannot unfortunately play the light like like the light gun version and. My plan is at one point, because I still have a TV, like the old CRT TVs, that can use light guns. I'm literally going to get like a PAL or a Japanese PS1, because I have a gun for it, and the gun will work. Or anything. And I'm just going to get a Japanese version or whatever version so I can play it. Because like, the reason why we can't play it was because I think when that game came out, it was shortly after the big school shooting that we had, like the Columbine shooting. So like... Mm-hmm. That was, like, a big no-no in video games was, like, guns and violence. So that was, like, a huge censorship thing. But, yeah, like, these these games are getting super expensive. Like, Resident Evil 2, I saw at that store for, like, 70 bucks. And I'm like, Jesus. Then, like, I looked online. I was like, oh. Uh, oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So I just checked uh, eBay in the U.S. And just the cartridge for Resident Evil 2 N64 is generally going for about 40 45 bucks really a little bit more just for the cartridge um somebody sold a boxed uh great shape but it doesn't say that it's complete i don't think it has the manual that was 120 dollars without the without the manual so yeah now yeah mm. i mean i'm looking at one right now uh, it's 160 complete in box uh the box is pretty warm but not like, like terrible like it still closes and everything it still holds up Oh, wow, it's got the inserts. Um, I actually kind of want to buy this right now. This is dangerous. <laughs> oh, I have four versions now. Fuck yeah. Oh, no, this is legit. Like, he took it apart. He's showing everything. You know, I'm saving this. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, I think oh. for me, I'll, just, I'll track down a cartridge, and then I'll just get somebody to reproduce a box for me i'm not i'm not paying out too much Actually, it's just to go on the shelf with all the rest of them to be honest i, I just want it i mean dude if it's not too expensive like i'll i'll give you one of my versions like i said i got three of them so like it won't work in my 64 but i mean fuck all, right, it, right? all right well yeah i mean if you can't find one for a good price in your country and stuff like that let me know i'll send you one of mine um all right, all right, no. because all the three that i have were in really good shape and yeah like in, from what i noticed recently reproduction boxes coming out of your country uh on etsy they're not mm. too expensive. I mean, like, uh, the, cause I think the shipping hits me a little bit for a little bit more, but, uh, but the boxes are really good. Like, I've got a Resident Evil 2 box. I've got a Pocky and Rocky. I've got Killer Instinct. Uh, you know, I've been buying a lot of them. And, like, I remember Nintendo was trying to shut them down. Like, a lot of company, game companies are trying to shut them down. It's like, dudes, you don't, like, you're not, like, limited run where you're actually recreating old games and cartridges and, and boxes. Like, you give no access to these. People want these. There's, what's the difference from somebody making $10 off a box where someone's selling an original, let's say, like, Mario Super Mario World box for, like, $100? Why aren't you going after them? Yeah, it's so true. That's... <laughs> It's, you would it's, like. it's, another, it's another question for the game preservation argument, though, isn't it? I mean, fucking hell. Mm. Well, that's, mm. It's a nightmare. It is what we live in. Oh, God, backwards yeah. compatibility is like the, the bare minimum. We're not even getting that. Like, ugh, pisses me off. Yeah, I mean, well, we, we did bully a multi-billion dollar company into keeping, like, the PlayStation 3 going. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Take the wins when you get them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, um... We might be doing a House of the Dead episode, depending on if it, it wins a poll that's going on right now as we speak. And I was just, like, looking up how we can play all those games. Uh, and funnily enough, the only real way to play the original House of the Dead, at least until the remake comes out, is on the PS3 store. So I'm really happy that that's open right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it, it is on there. I mean, you could... It's on there and that's it. I mean, if you go to Wii, you can play House of the Dead 2 and 3 on the Wii. And there's yeah. House of the Dead 4 or Overkill on there as well. Um, yeah, Overkill's on the Wii, yeah. Yeah, I have, I have all those on the Wii and stuff. But, I, I mean, you can you can emulate them too. The Dolphin emulator actually works well with, like, Wii emulation because you can actually buy a sensor bar and plug it into your PC. Is it like a USB thing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, 
uh, yeah, like, really... Wait, wait, is it USB? Yes, it was USB, because I, we had done it for... I played Dark Side Chronicles for one of our Toys for Tots charity streams that we did. I had my friend Sabrina come over, and we played it, and uh, we, we played it on there and stuff, but... Uh, I mean, it didn't run too well, but I'm, I'm not sure about House of the Dead, if it runs good or not, but, uh, yeah, the, the Dolphin emulator does work really well with Wii games, and House of the Dead is kind of, I mean, if you have a Switch, House of the Dead 2, uh, 1 is getting remastered, I don't know if you guys uh, knew about that. Yeah. I mean, what about typing of the dead, though? I mean, that's the real shit, right? I have that still! <laughs> I I actually walked into the, the game store that I usually go to, I walked into the place, and I'm like... I, I, I've gotten to like know the owner, and I was like, John, is that uh, the keyboard for typing of the dead? And he's like, uh, yeah, like we got the game in here too, and I'm like, I'll take it. And he's like, game on Dreamcast. <laughs> yep, I, I still have it on, I still have my Dreamcast. Like, I could probably actually know what I'm thinking about now because there is, I, I don't know if like you guys know this, but there is an emulator called Redream, like R E Dream, and if you pay like a one time fee of five bucks. You can play now. You can play Dreamcast games as you normally played them back in the day. But if you pay the five dollars, you get a graphical upgrade to them. They're they're smoother out. They're more crisp. They're clear. There's no fuzziness. You know these things are like crystal clear games. I was playing things like Power Stone and House of the Dead on there, and I couldn't believe how beautiful these games looked. Uh, it's another argument for game preservation. Just another argument for game preservation, Tony. I'm like, fuck, my man, we're languishing. We need better stuff than we've got. <laughs> it's so well, it's just like, it, it just, and I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. I, Typing of the Dead can be downloaded. It actually works. I'm like, oh, I, I just thought about that. Because <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I tried playing House of the Dead on stream a couple times with the controller, and it just doesn't work. It's not the same. Mm. You, yeah, you die a lot. I haven't been to a convention in a very long time. Tony, you've probably been to one more recently than I have. Like I remember for a long time there was always at least one person at every convention like dressed up with the typing of the dead keyboard around their shoulders. D is does that guy still exist? Is there still always one typing of the dead cosplayer? I have not seen that. Now? I have not seen that personally at any cons I've gone to, but I've seen the photos like over the years of that like 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 people have had them at um like I've seen like horror conventions that had them. Uh places down in Florida did it. Uh, I see I seen like guys down in Florida um Katsucon, I think had a few uh, like one or two of them. Um, mm. like they like yeah, that's like the one like the giant like Dreamcast on their back and shit, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There must be maybe there's just one guy who lives sort of down in the south of England who goes to the same conventions that I used to. Maybe it was the same guy every time. I don't know. But I always used to see at least one typing of the dead costume whenever I'd go somewhere like that. It's such Isn't a fun cast masquerading as a proton pack. What? Right, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh god, god Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters! I could go on about Ghostbusters and my love for that so fucking much. Me both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot. You're a huge Ghostbusters. You know what? Like maybe that will oh, be yeah. a discussion for another podcast. Everything because like I because actually you know like uh, quick thing. I actually played on stream. I had a what I called because like, I did like a Super Nintendo night and then I did a Game Boy night. Uh, it sucks that you guys can't ever see the streams because by the time I stream, you guys are already like in bed. Um, yeah, tell me about it. But um, I try and keep black count, Tony. But most of the time, I'm like. Uh, I'll be having a good night. Like, yeah, I got <laughs> <laughs> But like, I played. It was Ghostbusters Two on the Game Boy. I didn't know this existed. And when you play the game graphically, it looks like Pokemon, and it works. But here's the funny thing: this style predates Pokemon by six years. I don't think I've even heard of this. I didn't either. Like, I was just looking through I didn't games. Know there was a Game Boy one. Yeah, like, I, 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 I oh, knew there was the NES, NES one, and the NES, NES one was terrible because I have that one. Um, Isn't that the one where you're like a, just a logo driving around like a street grid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The there ghosts was, falling yeah. down. Yeah, those are. Uh, okay, I see what I'm looking at here. So there is a um, there's an NES game called I don't know why it's called this, but it's called New Ghostbusters Two. And it's very similar to this. So I wonder if this obviously came first. And then Ooh! They, this version. Because, it, it, yeah, it's like... It very much looks similar. I, I don't even know how to describe it. But, yeah, just characters running around a little house. Yeah, like, and stuff. like I said, it looks like how the original Pokemon games look. So, like, when I was playing it on stream, I actually had, like, my mind blown. I was like, holy shit, because I just saw Ghostbusters 2, you know, oh, download, you know. Like, I didn't even, like, look at any of the photos and stuff. I just booted it up uh, after we played a couple other Game Boy games. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> This dude makes me feel good. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you, you remember in the, the second movie um, when they, they got the toaster dancing to Jackie uh, Wilson? 
That's one of my favorite scenes. My father uh, told me a story because, like, oh, when I was taking one of his doctor's appointments, I had I had that song playing on Spotify. And he turns to me and he goes, did I ever tell you about the time that I was uh, I worked security for him? And I was like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, it was uh, I, it was uh, the thing like the, the police got to do, like, uh, I think like, I think he came to Boston or something like that. But like police got to do um, like work the concert for him and everything like that. And Jackie actually came up to my father, shook his hand. And he's like, look, these girls, they're going to get wild. It's going to get crazy here. I need you to do whatever you can. To keep them off the stage. And my dad back then, like, you know, he was a 5'10 Italian dude, but he was fucking jacked. Like, we're talking Chris Redfield jacked or anything, you know? Because, like, when my father got out of the Air Force, he just, like, lifted weights, like, for four years. And he was just, like, a human fucking V. So uh, my dad goes, all right, you got it. And my dad, my dad said it. He's like, yeah, like, they, they charged the stage. We held back and everything because, I mean, unfortunately, Jackie Wilson was known as, like, a, as, a, as a womanizer, too. But, like, you know, you try to throw on a concert, you can't have people, like, jumping on the stage at you. That's awesome. I, I know that, like, that happened to Tom Jones. Like Tom Jones had like women that used to like rush the str- like string, they throw like underwear at him and bras and shit. And I was just like, and it is Tom Jones. I can understand. He's a gr- he's got a good voice. <laughs> but um, yeah, like I just like blown that you live with Chris Redfield, Tony. Like literally, <laughs> ex Air Force, then police. Like okay. That's what, that's what I always thought. Like uh, uh, Steve, actually, you'll you'll like this. Uh, you'll like this little uh, story. Um, like my, cause my dad was former Air Force. When I first discovered Street Fighter. Uh, I walked into this place. I won't go into the whole detail of the story, of, like the because that will take too long. But uh, first time I saw Street Fighter Two, I saw Guile on the airfield fighting Blanca, and Guile yeah. became like my best character uh, back in the day. Like he was a character I always used. It always like but it reminds me of like my dad. And I would tell my dad this story, and he's like, "Well, he's jacked like I was, but I didn't have a broomstick on my head." And I was like, yeah no. yeah, no, I get that. <laughs> oh, man, OG Street Fighter 2, though, Kyle was busted, right? I think he didn't have charge moves back then. It was just taps. I mean, like, like everybody was taps, busted taps, back forward. then. Everybody oh. was busted back then in the old Street Fighter days. Because, like, especially, oh, my God, throwing moves? Holy shit, you get somebody in a fucking throw? Like, you lose, like, 40 to 50% of your life, I feel, which is kind of funny that they replicated that in Street Fighter Cross Tech. And I remember when I was playing it, I'm like, why do I feel like I'm playing Street Fighter 2 with throwing? Like... This is bullshit. They passed that eventually, but. Oh man. Mm. <laughs> um, so nostalgic I... now for not playing games. Oh, oh yeah. god, that, that, that's something that you and I could talk about because I've had a couple of uh, people on here about podcasts and fighting games, so I can definitely go back and talk about more. But uh, how are we doing on time for you guys? How are we doing on time? I'm still good. I got 40 minutes or so. Oh, perfect. Um, all right. So you know what? Let's um, let's like all right. So you guys have like let's talk some village because you guys have played village. You've beaten it and everything. Uh. You know, like, what do you, what do you guys feel about the direction that it's gone? Like, what it, like, received? Because I, I, I do have gripes with it, but I do really like the game. But how do you guys feel on what they did with this version? Like, what they changed, what they added, and all that good stuff? I'm very high on it, to be honest. I think it's, it's really good. And I said this, we just covered it this weekend. Um <laughs> It wound up being far and away the longest podcast we've ever done because everyone had so much to say. But it's it reminds me of when I, we were just talking about when RE4 came out and it was like such a head fuck because it was so different. Um, not just the perspective, but also the big jump in action, the amount of action going from horror games to being much more action focused. Because Seven came first. Village makes a whole lot more sense. If we'd have started with this game, I feel like it would have uh, had a really bad negative reaction. But because 7, we had this sort of setup for Village to then to sort of tweak in an action direction, it makes a lot of sense to me. I, I really love the gameplay. Uh, I really love the world of the game. I've got some gripes here and there. Story's kind of got some holes I don't like. But overall, I was, I was pretty happy with it. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't know where it goes from here, but... As a standalone, I was I was pretty into it. Yeah, it's like if if RE, if RE Seven was actually the first of its series, it's the perfect mm. sequel to it. But um, I think there's mechanical shit that pisses me off, like the way the guns work. I, I, I talk about this in the podcast, but basically the way the guns work in villages, you get the next gun along, just immediately switch to that and up its capacity, and it already outclasses the other gun in every capacity, making it completely like half the magic for me for RE Four and those action games is each weapon has some kind of unique selling point to it. They don't in Village. It literally is a case of you might have a slightly prettier looking gun, 
that's got less stats, or you can have... It seems to be the uglier the gun gets, the deadlier it gets. Um, I liked the environment. I, I loved the uh, the way you could get around and possibly poke around and find loot and shit. Much like Sai, I think the story's still a bit too... Uh, well, it's not Swiss cheese, but it's fucking got a lot of holes in it. And I would argue... that I think they go for like some kind of Dark Souls thing where they don't put all the information out for you and you have to try and piece it out and we just haven't got all the puzzle pieces. Um, narratively, it's uh, the performances, rather, not the narrative. The, perf the performances of the characters, uh, I had no complaints. Like, it feels like Ethan's very real and then yep. he's around a theatre troupe of maniacs, which <laughs> it, yeah, I think works pretty well. It's, like, it's pretty much what happened in Seven, isn't it? Ethan in that was, for a lot of people, a little bland, but he's the everyman versus people who are extra. So... Uh, that still works. Uh, some boss fights are complete dog shit. We're looking at you, Mr. Heisenberg. You know, uh, not, not not the biggest fan of the uh, Michael Bay's Transformers, anyway. So I thought the it's, same it's... thing when I was playing that. I literally at one point I, I just said I said to myself, Autobots transform and roll out. And I remember like just being in the air with like Heisenberg, and I'm just like, one shall stand, one shall fall. <laughs> That boss fight would be way better if you didn't, like, go, here's a convenient plot armor tank for you, like, <laughs> five seconds before. And you fight the same fucking fight on foot afterwards. Uh, I don't know. It, it, it pisses me off that bit. Um, to nutshell it, though, I don't think it's going to make quite the same series-wide impact as four, but as a direct sequel to seven, it's okay. Uh, don't know if I think it's stronger than seven, for me personally. Hmm. Uh, I would argue RE2 Remake out of the recent, uh, you know, batch of RE engine games. I think 2 Make is still probably probably still up there for me. Um, I, but that doesn't mean that Village is bad by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I mean, to be fair, I, I don't think any of the RE engine games are bad. Yeah, you know, I, I love Devil May Cry 5. I love Monster Hunter World as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to sit on this fence. All right, yeah, no, I, I, can, I can respect that. that. I, can I can respect, respect that, that greatly because I'm... I'm I'm kind of the same. I feel that the games do kind of have, like, a very... Like, the, this plot has, like, a lot of holes in it. Like, I call it Swiss cheese when me and the Rogue guys talked about it and stuff. And I feel that, like, the game has, like, an identity crisis. But I... Because, like, you know, some parts it feels like RE4. Sometimes it feels like RE6. Sometimes it feels like Call of Duty. Sometimes it feels like horror. Sometimes it feels like Silent Hill. And I'm just like... Because uh, when we got to the part where you play as Chris, I was like, you know what? We've, they've thrown everything else at it. Fuck it up. Let's go. Lock and load. That's just going to waste every motherfucker in front of me. Like, I didn't even care. Um, I mean, we, we talked about this on the podcast, didn't we, Sai? How that uh, that bit, while would probably be shit as its own game, as like a Chris as a character coming in as like the battering ram fucks everything up, you know, and get, you know, gets, the sh gets shit done. It's probably the best way to use it. Yeah, you can't put him in um, in a horror game anymore. No way. You know, with the history that character's had, you know, he should be big macho, kill everything, man. So it makes sense. Like, for me, it did kind of like, it was a bit of a wet fart when it happened. Uh, but following that boss fight that you just talked about as well, it's just like, oh, where is this going? Yeah, yeah I mean, at the end of it, I, I didn't mind it so much. Yeah, I, I think the only way that you could have Chris be in a solo game himself and not have him go fall like Call of Duty is literally do what they do in like metroid prime samus is all powerful but then she gets all of her fucking systems knocked offline and has to like regain everything have that happen to chris have him get captured have like his weapons break like have like a big fucking boss fight at the beginning where like his guns actually break on him like the boss like cuts the gun in half and shit and then he's stuck uh in like this new area where he has to like scrounge and survive like you know he has to find newer guns that aren't like military grade weapons you know like i think that would be like the only way you could do it right so like, um, say it's Co Veronica, right? For the sake of example, right? You have a little bit before he climbs up the mountain and he's storming it with his gear, and then he does what he does in Co Veronica and loses his bag full of good stuff. Exactly. You know, in the, in the S.D. Perry novel, he had fucking grenades in that shit. And it's like, that would have been huge for the fucking worm. Oh, man. Uh, I, I do wonder, like, you know, when you say powering down like Samus, I'm just, I'm just picturing someone, like, doing the full Bane Batman on him and breaking his back, and that's why he can't run or shit, you know? <laughs> be a bit too brutal on Chris Redfield, though. I mean, like, I mean, he, Samus, I think, got, like, not, like, I think she got, like, just knocked really hard, and, like, her systems went offline. I mean, it's been years since I played Metroid Prime. Oh, man. Uh, Metroid Prime, though, like, you know, Samus can either, like, just walk down a corridor and tank laser blast after laser blast, but if it's a cutscene, 
Oh man, she could like just trip over a stone and lose all her gear. <laughs> I love those games. <laughs> yeah, gotta find a reason to set you yeah. back to number one, don't they? They've got to find something. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, think that would be a good reason, like you know, for Chris, like you know, like he like, like there is a fight where you get to do like you know the stuff he's known for, and then he has to like find like less superior weapons and work with them. I think something like that would be like really cool, honestly. You no, know, I actually really like that idea and i know i feel like every time i have this conversation about what and the next chris game should be or you know if you're going to do something like that where he has to scrounge to survive and it's just him alone you know using his environment it's the perfect halo reach ending of chris has to survive until he can't for me like that's the perfect way to bow him out if if anything like, he really goes down swinging all the way down to the end. Because I think it's time. I'm going to be that person. I think it's time that some of the characters take a reduced role, whatever that is. Oh, dude, I think we're all in the same boat. I think, I think we're all in the same boat as you are. I really do. Dude's 47 in Village. Like, it's 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 time. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, Jill's probably like, uh, cause she's only a couple years younger. So she's like... Yeah, she's 45, I think. Pretty sure. Yeah. So, and Leon's like... I think this is like only like a year or two younger than because I think he's like 45 too. Yeah, I think pretty much all the cast is mid 40s except Chris, who's obviously uh, on the wrong side of 45. Yeah, and Barry's like, you know, in his 50s at this point or late 50s, Barry's, I think. Oh, yeah, he's, Barry's gonna, next time we see him, he's gonna have a big long Gandalf beard. Well, like, didn't, it, didn't like he make, um, like, I think like he made a joke in like one of the Revelations guide about like having like bad knees or something like that. Uh, I think it was like a, like a, like an ode to him getting older, but I think he actually did. Um, yeah, which is why he doesn't do field work. Uh, but I, I was just like, you know, after seeing what he does in Revelations two, I don't think he's got bad knees. <laughs> that no, dude got knocked off a cliff. Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> Barry Burton. I'll tell you something that always made me laugh is the the Perry novel makes him sound like he's built like a really big dude. Yeah, like a yeah, burly dude, yeah. Yeah, I didn't really start seeing that until Revelations 2. I, like, I always seemed like a bit more of a chunky dude. Um, to me, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you can kind of see how he's built. Like, if you play him in Mercenaries in RE5, you kind of see, like, how he's built. Mm. And, like, he's, bu he's built pretty solid. And, like, yeah, like, Jesse Barry novels, like, they're, 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 like, they're like, yeah, like, he's... He's like a he's a like he's got big arms and shoulders and everything like that. I mean, he even tried to. I remember he tried to shoulder tackle one of the doors in the S.D. Perry novel, and he actually like almost hurt himself. Mm. Um, well, it comes across like a power lifter or something, doesn't it? Pretty much, yeah. And you know, I think that like I mean, I, I love Revelations too. I'm so glad that so many people are finally discovering how great that game really is because. In my opinion, that is probably one of the better Resident Evil games they have made because, like, in in recent years, I should say, like, pre, like you know, after like Res the events of Resident Evil like four and five, I think Rev Two really stands on what it's uh, what fans wanted because we got you know Alex Wesker, we got Claire Redfield, we got Barry Burton and everything, we got Natalia, we got um, Barry's daughter in there as well, Moira. Yeah, yeah. We had we had her, and there's so many throwbacks to. What was it like Natalia was on Terra Grigia, so there's a throwback to Revelations One. Uh, they talked about Ouroboros, which was you know throwback to Five. They talked about a lot of things in the old ones, like when Natalia gets to that mansion and she's like, "Oh, I'd love to live in a place like this." And Barry's like, "I've had enough fill of uh, mansions for one lifetime." And I was like, "Oh, he said the thing." <laughs> and plus, yeah, he's, it's, he's just got dad it's jokes, it's like you know, the, it's, it's like the whole thing, like. Uh, Break out time to break out the beer and nachos. And I'm like, I'm fucking done. This is the greatest Resident Evil character of all time. Let's not forget, I'll always need you, but right now, I have this. I... Oh, what a moment. Oh, I fanboyed so hard that. Because then he does like a 1980s action slow-mo walk away from the helicopter. I'm like, this dude is a fucking beast. He's like, I'm going to put you and your whole goddamn family in the ground. And I'm like, this is like... The greatest Resident Evil character of all time. I'm sorry, Jill. I love you, but Barry is king. So, you know, I want to talk about RE7 being the big comeback, but it really was Rev 2. If it weren't for, like, a few people getting maybe a bit upset about localization stuff, it's the... It's pretty fantastic, that game. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, I agree with that. I think, yeah, Rev 2 was sort of, like, pulling back the, the baseball bat before the big swing of 7 for me. Like, Steve mentioned my... my prior YouTube stuff, my video game reviews. And one of the earliest ones I did was Revelations 2. 
And I remember saying at the beginning that like this is the probably the best Resident Evil game in like a decade because of everything that has gone into it in terms of amount of like fan service as well as the way that I really enjoyed the way that it plays in terms of it's it's your over the shoulder action game, but the environments make it spooky and horrory, and you've got the elements of these characters that can't defend themselves as well. I think it's great, like it, especially considering you know RE6, which was. RE6. Uh, <laughs> this was, yeah, definitely along the right path again. It, it's it's so overlooked, but it's brilliant. No, it's, it's true. Like I, I, I love Rev 2. I, I know like it was like a budget game too and everything like that. And, yeah, but, it was uh, outsourced. Yeah, well. it was outsourced, but like it was outsourced to the right people because they just, mm. they seemed to understand exactly what this was supposed Because like one of the reasons like why RE2 Remake worked was because people who worked on the original RE2 worked on this and they brought fans in like it's like I remember you guys probably know that um the guys who originally made Resident Evil 2 remake like the fan project from like the they took like uh things from the Dark Side Chronicles uh to like yeah. rebuild it mm. uh they got the cease and desist but Capcom brought them on to like work on the actual remake so and that's like how one of the reasons why Final Fantasy 7 remake worked because they had original developers uh, from the first game brought on, and developers that are, are new were also fans of the original one. So that's why, like, things like Rev work. Because I always have this saying that fans do it better. And I did, like, a top 10 episode about, like, the top 10, like, you know, uh, video game fan projects, like, based on, you know, like, on games, like, you know, like, all the, like, Street Fighter Assassin's Fist and all those ones that are out there. Because fans just understand it. And Rev 2 is very apparent. And not even just, like, did they give, give you a great, like, campaign, which was, like, it never felt like it changed. You always felt that it was horror all the way through. Even, like, when things got crazy in boss battles or, you know, even at the end of the game, it still felt very horror-like, and it worked. Mm. And they gave you raid mode. They didn't need to give you raid mode, but they did. Perhaps the best minigame in any Resident Evil game ever. Besides maybe mercenaries, I'm not saying that I want to see a, comp a companion mini game of just those two being sold. But Capcom, it's easy money, you know. Oh my I god! Buy it. Yeah. I did buy it. Oh yeah, no, dude. You give me, you give me a full raid mode game, or you give me a full mercenaries game, or you like get like a package deal for two of them. I will buy fucking five copies of that shit. Anything, because mercenaries. I mean, I I cannot tell. Like my, I told you about my friend earlier. Uh, she and I are playing RE5. We've been playing the mercenaries together for years. Like we, like she, like when she finally got into like Resident Evil again, like you know it was RE4 on the Wii, but then we had her get RE5 on the PS3, and she just loved it. And like the mercenaries was always fun, and Six's mercenaries one I've been playing a lot more. But I didn't play it too much back in the day, and I missed out because I've been playing Five for, like constantly for years. But now Six is just like you just see how well it works, and then raid raid mode on Red Two is so much better than the first one because my buddy and I years ago when the, when the 3DS version came out of the original we we beat it and then we played raid mode together because you, you can't do co-op in Revelations 1 which I think is so very strange I think they wanted to they just couldn't get it to work on the 3DS but uh, raid mode and that was so broken I was like dude I've been here for like five hours you feel we're getting anywhere and he's like I mean we're leveling up dude but I don't think I feel like we're in a grind and then like Rev 2 it's not easier to level up but it's more balanced. Balance, that's what I'm looking for. It's balanced. Yeah, and you can, like, skill up and customize your character a bit more. Oh, yeah. Like, there's so much more you can do with it. And Rev 2 just, like, it just gives you, like, you will lose hours of your life to that game like I have. <laughs> like, when it comes to raid mode. It's the one I put the most hours in, in terms of, like, extra game modes. Or Rev 2's raid mode, definitely. I would definitely have to say it's mercenaries for me, but, like, raid mode for Rev 2 is definitely, uh, like, up there for me. Like, the only thing that it's missing, really, is, like, I would have liked more throwback maps from Revelations 1. I thought the maps were okay. The fact that we get, like, a handful of RE6 ones and uh, just a little bit of the main campaign is a shame. Yeah. Uh, not, not, not to downplay it, because I do think, you know, in general, Rev 2's raid mode is, like, the... Like I said that before, it's probably the best minigame, or at least it is for me. Um, yeah, but damn. I, do you know... My my brain's tingling now. Like this <laughs> standalone mercenaries title. Wait till remake four comes out, and then you've got a selection of maps from two, three, four, seven village because they're all on the same engine. Oh, and for God's sake, put some Devil May Cry maps in there. They're all on the same engine. You can do what you want. It's true. 
I'm not saying Red Grave, uh, Red Grave City, the the setting of Devil May Cry Five, <laughs> looks a bit like London in places, Sai. But it, it literally looks like if London and Tokyo had a baby. You're not so, wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'll, get there. I'll get to that franchise one day. I promise. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> I, I mean that, that. I mean that was that's a franchise nobody ever thought was coming back. Like we thought that was dead after that reboot. I mean, Devil May Cry Four wasn't even that bad, but like, I think the only misstep for me for that series is still really Devil May Cry Two, and I did not like the direction DMC was going in, so I didn't play it. Um, five though, God, it was like a nuclear bomb going off. Oh, I couldn't stop playing that thing when it came out. Oh, same. Like I, I just went nuts with that. It was it was amazing. Like and I just couldn't believe like how much love went in. Like like because I don't know if you guys know, but it's Suno, the guy who uh, did it and everything. He had a choice. It was either that or Dragon's Dogma two. See, I know people are going to be salty that Dragon's Dog Dogma. Uh, sorry, Dragon's Dogma two doesn't happen or it hasn't happened yet. But we have like the biggest love letter to the entire franchise. Uh, like, there's so many references to, like, the entire series in 5, and that's just, like, just subtle winks, and then you've got, like, the entire boss so the boss set for DMC1, pretty much, are, like, V's playable squad, aren't they? Um, with the exception of, like, Phantom. I don't think Phantom makes an appearance. Um, but, like, Griffin, The Shadow, Nightmare, and then, obviously, Virgil, big deal. Yeah. Like, the big deal. Oh, man. And then they, they piggybacked the whole, like, style swapping mechanic for Switch DMC3, didn't they, into the other one, right? Am I going crazy? Uh, yeah, like, you can, like, you can shoot, like, if you play DMC3, you can have, like, Gunslinger, Royal Guard, all those ones at once. You just gotta, like, oh, hit, the, hit the button like you can with uh, DMC5. And I think that was mm. a great thing. A lot of people thought, like, when they were announcing, like, the all, like, when DMC Trilogy was coming to, you know, the Switch... And they had like some big announcements and everything. People thought it was Dante for Smash. They thought that like Capcom was gonna like drop a trailer. It wasn't gonna be yeah. Sakurai. It was gonna be Capcom that drops the trailer in. Because if that had been done, and it's like, but we have one more thing to show you, and just he like you know he snaps his fingers, and then all of a sudden like Dante just comes in like and like knocks down all the Smash characters. Like I personally thought like when that Sephiroth trailer happened for Smash, I thought that was Dante or Virgil. When I saw that slice mm. come through, I'm like. Oh, is it Devil May Cry? Then all of a sudden the, the theme starts playing, and I'm like, oh god, no, no, what, no! <laughs> and this, this... I still think uh, I still think Dante's got a chance, even as someone who hasn't played Devil May Cry. Really, he's a character I'd love to see in it because I think it would fit so well, and he's so well loved. I, I'd love to see it. It's the weird thing, isn't it? Right, because I'm pretty sure we've all seen the the general like social media hubbub that if Smash gets another anime swordsman, they may actually like start killing people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, fair. With the exception of, if it's Dante, it's fine. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people... It's the thing that is, like, when a lot of these people that, like who write this stuff, they kind of just, like, don't do the research. People don't mind sword characters. They just don't want any more Fire Emblem characters. Because uh, everybody's... Yeah, maybe. Because everybody's, like, you know, like, oh, well, nobody complains when more Pokemon get added or when more Mario characters get added. It's like, dude, like, they're all different. I mean, yeah, like, you know, like... Mario, Luigi, and Wario, and Dr. Mario, they're, they're similar, but they still have enough to make them different. Fire Emblem characters do too, but at the same time, like, even my friends who are die-hard Fire Emblem characters are like, no more Fire Emblem characters. We got what we wanted, we have the characters, like, give other people what they want. And I'm like, damn, you guys, and like, that wasn't just my friends. Like, I, I was on, like, Smash Brothers um, pages and stuff, and they were all saying the same thing. All the ones who loved Fire Emblem were like, yeah, no, enough, we have enough. Like, give, like, what? Give Dante, like, give Ryu, like, uh, Ryu Hayabusa. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's a combination of sort of, like, the period of time that they were all dropped in. Yeah. Because like, obviously they weren't, there wasn't any Fire Emblem uh, in the first game. There was a couple in the next game. There was an extra character in Brawl, and then from there it started to get crazy. But also, there's, I think, as many Fire Emblem characters in Smash Brothers now as there is Legend of Zelda, which is a franchise that's, you know, 10 to 30 this year, I think. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, is it 30? No, 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 it's not 30 this year. It's or, a lot. Or next year or... It's, uh, I bet either way, like... That seems crazy. Like, yeah. Zelda has, you know, as many characters as Fire Emblem, which is... I'm sorry, but it's not as important as a series. Like, that's no skin off of Fire Emblem's nose. It hasn't been around nearly as long. It's... 
Metroid's got lot Ridley and Samus and, and Dark, Dark Samus, Samus, I suppose. Dark yeah. Samus, yeah. yeah, yeah, but I mean, like, who, else, who else can you really add from you know that? You know, like Creed, Mother Brain. You could have bi bipedal Mother Brain. You know, um, that's crazy. Just, just Mother, Mother Brain, Brain on wheels, wheels like, like uh, like the Koopa Kid. <laughs> uh, you know, there are dumber things, right? <laughs> I mean, we have a piranha plant. You can't say that it's not possible. We got a fucking plant. I mean, yeah. there's all the there's all the bounty hunters and stuff, isn't there? That uh, yeah, in want, I'm free. Um, I don't remember. Is it Cyrax? Not Cyrax. That's more combat. But you know, I, <laughs> there's oh, the, yeah. the, the important one in Metro uh, Prime that gets away or whatever uh, from mm. Metro Prime Three. People said that's the most likely one. I don't know. Uh, maybe Metro Prime Four, when it eventually comes, will introduce a character that people I mean, will get behind. You make a point with, by mentioning Cyrax, though. You know, Scorpion or Sub Zero <laughs> should really be there by now. You know, imagine it's it's crazy. Cause, and I, I love people who say that that's not possible because they're too violent. And I'm like, you have Bayonetta. I don't want to hear about violence because that chick in her games is more violent than any Mortal Kombat game. <laughs> yeah, it's just awesome. all about how you present it, isn't it? Like, they can, if they can cut around it, it shouldn't be too bad. Was it called Snake again? Size it. The uh, snake, sort of like breaks. Uh, you, you know best. That video, neck breaker. The the video that's not out yet. Yeah, where yeah. I to Snake as Sneaky Mc's neck Snappenberg. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Gun Shoes McGee, aka Bonetta. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, characters that shouldn't fit in with the Nintendo like style, but nobody bats an eyelid. So fuck it. Basically, what we're saying is, when is Jill gonna be in Smash? Oh my yeah. god, I, if, if I got her and not Dante, I would be sad, but I'd just be like, alright, I got Jill, I'd be happy with this. Um, but yeah, Dante, I think, like, he, like, I, I'm gonna be one of those guys, yes, I think Gino should be in Smash. He is so highly requested, and he's such a fun character to play in Super Mario RPG, but Dante, I think, would be, if I didn't get Gino and I got Dante, I'd be super happy. Like, if I had to choose one of the two, and stuff like that, and I got Dante, I would be so happy, because his play style from all the different games and stuff, is just insane. Like, he would be such a fun character. Because he's more than just a sword character. Unlike Fire Emblem characters, like, he has, like, other devil weapons and shit like that. Like, all the devil arm stuff. Yeah, he's got, like, a freaking... He's got Nevin, the guitar, and everything. He's got uh, the two swords from number th uh, from number three. He's got fucking projectiles. He's got guns. Like, he's got shotguns. Like, there's a lot he could do. Like, his moveset would just be insane. I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I hope... I mean, like, the thing of it is, like, They've picked this out for a long time, these characters. And we only have, like, what, two spots left? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. So, it's scary. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, who knows what happens after that. Smash Brothers is, like, one of the big franchises for me that I I really love following. And that comes from Smash Brothers Brawl when they had the daily updates on the website. Oh, man. That. That, that takes me back. Yeah, God. That's shit. That's, like that super dragged me into that fandom where everyone was speculating about the next daily update and people would stay up to stupid times of night to see what, you know, it's the item capsule, you know, absolutely nothing. And people will be upset that it wasn't <laughs> Sonic or whatever. So back in the day, I remember the two most requested characters from Brawl onwards were Ridley, uh, the character that made me cry when they announced him because it finally happened. I was so happy. And the other one was Gino. And there was kind of almost like a little bit of a civil war there because it seemed like for a long time neither of them were going to happen. And all the Gino fans were like, we'll get there, but Ridley's too big. And all the Ridley fans were like, who the fuck's Gino? Nobody cares. We'll get Ridley in. So now that Ridley's in, even though I don't... I've never played Super Mario RPG. I'd like to play it one day. I've never played it. I have no affinity for the character. I'd like Gino to be there as like a little bookend to that saga in the Smash Brothers community. But I don't, I don't know if I see it. I think it's going to be like... I'd like it to be Crash. I'd like Dante. I really like Eggman in there or something. Or, or Tails. Another Sonic rep would be cool. That's true. We only have one Sonic character, so... Exactly. And I think that's uh, hugely important. But he's that it's still crazy that he's in that game in, in some ways. But wouldn't it be cool to have Sonic and Tails versus Mario and Luigi? Or Sonic and <laughs> Bowser versus Sonic and... Uh, Sonic and Dr. Eggman versus Mario and Bowser? Like, That'd how be cool insane. would that be? I mean, call me, like, basically nostalgic for Marvel vs. Capcom 3, but I still think Nemesis. Um, they've got ranged great. tentacles, punches, rocket launches, and plus their blocking animation in that game is just taking the hit and not even doing anything. It was amazing. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's so true. That's it's true, so yeah. Like, when he blocks everything, like, it just stands there. <laughs> <laughs> Guy's got yeah, super, super armor out the ass. I don't, I don't like, know. I mean, I'm not... 
I feel I feel if, sorry, you, you should definitely play Super Mario RPG because I got to. this was a very different time from this was the first time Mario had ever gone like RPG. Like this was a big, big change. This is before like, you know, Mario sports games really, you know, like this like you know, like like, you know, like Mario Golf and you know, Total Souls Tour and you know, Mario Baseball and Mario Party. Like this was a really huge thing. And one of the reasons why fans love it so much was because it was so different. And characters, except for Mario, because he doesn't talk, he stays mute the whole time, like a typical RPG person. Um, mm -hmm. But, like, he, like, transforms into characters to tell the story and, like, and reenact, like, fights and stuff. It, it, it's cute. But, like, Gino is, like, this wise, like, sage, and Mallow's, like, this young catapult. You get the Bowser's on your team, and he's just a jackass. Like, he always tries to act like a tough guy, and, like, like the, they stop him from, like, breaking stuff all the time, and he's just... Uh, you know, he thinks he's, like, Mr. Tough Guy, but, like, there's scenes, like, where he's crying and you can't let anybody see him crying. Uh, that, sounds good. Like, that sounds great because it's, like, that era of Square that I really like as well. I yeah. know a lot of people got nostalgia for that, but it's, it's come back to what we were saying about, you know, preservation. I can't I can't get my hands on that damn game. It's, it's, it's hard to find and, like... It's I mean, only I, mini Super NES. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly that. Or, of course, you know, you're left with emulation and I... With emulation, I'll, I'll do it if I own the game already, because then, you know, I'm legally allowed to emulate it because I own a physical copy. Or B, it gets to the point where you won't let me play it in any other way. And that's on you, and that's my opinion. If you won't make this available to me, what do what you expect people to do? Yeah, let us give you, your, give you our money kind of well, thing, isn't it? We'll pay for it if you put it on the Switch store in this example. And I, Because Super Mario RPG on the Switch would be great. I could take it with me everywhere. It's an RPG. That's what you want. But if you don't do that... <laughs> what do you expect? Yeah, I mean, like, honestly, you, you, like, if, if they were to announce Super Mario RPG coming to the, uh, Super, uh, for the Switch, and you had to pay for it, like, it wasn't coming to that free section where all the Super Nintendo games are, and they're like, yeah, you're gonna have to pay $15 for it. I'm like, bitch, I will pay 20 give it to me now! <laughs> like, exactly. I, will, I will literally pay for it, because that game is, like, literally one of the greatest games of all time. Like, it's a, it's a simple RPG, because one of my, my, one of my friends, um, Latina Otaku, she's a cosplayer that I shoot with here in Boston, and we're really good friends, and uh, she just went through and played the game for the first time, and she loved it. Like she really loved how this game was because she played Final, like Final Fantasy and other um, RPGs and stuff like that. And she's like, "Yeah, it's really kind of easy compared to other RPGs." I was, like, yeah. I was like, "Yeah, like your your level cap is like level thirty, not level ninety nine. Um, it's not exactly a tough game, but they really did a, a an interesting way of like creating a world." in that game like a world that you really truly enjoyed like it just every character that you came across was was written funny they're 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 kooky they're insane they have something to prove there's boss battles that happen where this one guy is just literally talking about it's like they think i'm a hothead but i'll show them and the mario and the others are like uh, uh okay if you could just let us buy he goes it's showtime and it's just like it, it, dude we don't want to fight we just want to get by you and he just starts like throwing bombs at you and shit and punching you and stuff is he literally just wants to be this big time thing, and you never know why. There, and there's a there's a crocodile that you keep running into and stuff like that. He talks like a like a 1930s gangster, like the way like it, like his his uh, his word is written and stuff like that. It's it's so fun. Like like I said, the game is just colorful. It's in a way that like you never really saw Final Fantasy games do it. Like they they perfectly took like what's great about Mario games and incorporated it into a brand new way that we hadn't seen before. Hell, Toad keeps getting captured from time to time in the game, and you got to save him. <laughs> Every time I see anything from it, like, the the word that comes to mind is charming. It just seems yep. so charming. It, it, there's just a lot of love. When it, whether they're putting brand new characters into the game or they're using characters from past Mario games in this, the love is there, and it's a game that I... I it's like, if I had, like, make a list of, like, a top ten games you have to play... That would definitely be on that top ten because you just cannot, like you, you just it just does so much. I can't speak anything bad about the game. Uh, like even it doesn't even feel like it's a short game either. It's a decent length. I mean they do like they've got they've got throwbacks to everything. There's one part where like Mario tries to fight a bunch of people and Mallow's like, "Who do you think you are, Bruce Lee or something? We're gonna get creamed if we go in there," or um. There's a, there's a there's a there's a boss battle that's a throwback to the Power Rangers and I was just like I like I love it. <laughs> it's right up your street, yeah. Oh my god, is it ever? But yeah, like you, you <laughs> have to find some way to play it, dude, because it's when you play it, you're just gonna you're just gonna be like I have been missing out. 
Because it is, it is a rare game now. It is pretty expensive. I think the yeah. only way to get it is on the... I think the Wii U still has it, because the Wii U didn't stop oh. their... I don't think the Wii U stopped their servers yet. I know the Wii did, anything, but the Wii U servers, I think, are still going for older games. And I'm pretty sure Super Mario RPG is on that and Earthbound is on that. Oh, wow. I had no idea. Oh, okay. People, people lost their mind. I need to play. Oh, people, yeah. people lost their mind when Earthbound came to that. And I was like, finally. I mean, I don't own it. I had the chance to own it years ago when I was cheap. I was like... You know, 10 years ago, I could have paid $100 for it, but I was a stupid punk back then, and I, I kicked myself every day for not doing it, because that thing's like $400 now. <laughs> Jesus, really? That's insane. Okay, sorry. Um... Yeah, no, it's like, you look at Earthbound and what it's worth and stuff, it's stupid rare, because that game didn't get a lot of advertising when it came to America. Like, nobody knew what Earthbound was, so like, I knew what it was, because a buddy of mine back in the day, he had it, and we spent like a summer just beasting that game and having a blast with it. But the problem was it didn't get the proper advertisement. So it never got any exposure in America. Like people were too busy playing like Donkey Kong Country and the Mar and Super Mario World and Killer Instinct and all these, these other games they amped up on the Super Nintendo. So when, N when the N64 rolled around and you got, uh, there was supposed to be a Metro, uh, sorry, uh, Earthbound 4. Because technically Earthbound is, is Mother 3. Um... Mm. That was in, in, in actually in Earthbound, you literally go to a, like a, a building and it says uh, you know uh, we're uh, closed for making uh, Mother Four Earthbound uh, you know Earthbound Two as it was going to be called because it was going to be on the N sixty four, but that never happened. They tried it for the N sixty four and it didn't. So when Ness showed up in Smash Brothers, people were like well, who's Ness? What's Earthbound? I didn't know. And because you can still run Super Nintendo games back then, yeah, people started to discover a little bit who Ness was, but it wasn't really until years later when the internet became more prominent that other people were like, holy shit, this game looks fun. Like, yeah, Ness, like, Smash Brothers did a lot for Ness because that I'm one of the, like, millions of people that had no idea. Like, you boot up Smash Brothers and like, I don't know who the hell this kid is. I know everybody else, but I don't know who this kid is. Yeah, he was... It's he, the same thing as, like, Fire Emblem, isn't it, in uh, Melee, where it, like, exposed everybody to it and went, oh, yeah, you should check this out, except... We couldn't know. yet. Yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah. yeah, we weren't we weren't privileged, privileged to that just yet. yet. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of it's like, like Terry from Smash Brothers. I couldn't believe there were so many people out there who didn't know who Terry Bogard was. But then when you give him the... When you give him the look I'm not the even facts. a fighting game. I'm not really a fighting game person, and even I knew. <laughs> yeah, like, you knew, but, like, I, I, I do remember that... You know, King of Fighters was never big in Japan, and it was never big in America. It was never big really in Europe. It was always Brazil, like you know, South America. That's where the game flourished, and that's where a lot of people like you know loved the King of Fighters for years. And like it made its obviously it made its way to America, and later King of Fighters games got a lot of love. But it was really South America that kept King of Fighters alive. So you know, a lot of all of a sudden, like all like these South American players are coming out of nowhere for online Smash tournaments and. You know, and then posting Smash videos, and you know, people are like, shit, this guy's really a big deal. And uh, Terry Bogart's one of my favorite characters of all time. So when he got int introduced to Smash, I was like, I like, jumped out of my chair. I was like, yes! <laughs> yeah, no, KF KOF's been with me since, like, the early 2000s. My mate showed me one thing. It was King of Fighters 2002. And, uh, my God, yeah, seeing him, seeing him, like, debut in Smash, I even got Smash on my Switch yet. And I was like, oh... This is going to go down. And the fact that SNK, <laughs> well, I was it. Um, Nintendo say, yeah, which tracks can we use? And they just went, yeah, you can have all of them. All right, so yeah. you pretty much get like 50 tracks for one character. It's like amazing stuff. Yeah. Piece of history. They, they, that's the thing about Smash Brothers, I've always said. They're not, they can't top what they've done now. Ultimate literally is its name. You cannot top what you've done. If you try to like take a break and then make a new Smash Brothers later on, you will have, like, because of the popularity, companies like Konami, Sega, well, I mean, Sega and Nintendo are, are in better position than they ever have been, but, like, you know, Capcom, you know, like, you're gonna, they're gonna want, you know, more money to use the licenses for these characters because they make, Nintendo makes so much, and we might get a, a thing where Nintendo's like, yeah, you know, we're not gonna pay you for that, so Solid Snake's gone again, and, you know, like, you know, we're not gonna include Mega Man or Ryu, and if you don't, I'm gonna, uh, you know, you do that, I fucking kill you guys. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do that, but that would really, that would be, so the thing of it is, you just update the game. Continue updating it every couple of years, throw in a couple of new characters, kind of like what, 
I, best, I think like one of the best examples of that was kind of, uh, not like how Street Fighter Five did it, you know, like they did really well, but I, I'm talking like D- Dead or Alive 5. DOA 5 did it pretty well because they launched with a very healthy roster of characters, but over the course of like seven years, seven or eight years, they not just gave you costumes, but they balanced, patched everything, and they gave new characters. So I feel that that could be Smash Brothers' big uh, thing right there if they just keep the game supporting because that way they won't i mean i i think that licensing can run out on characters but i think that's if you make a new game i, I think from uh just continuing to use the same game over and over and over i think it'll be fine i mean a uh, similar method killer instinct where they do a season and then the last season's rolled in for free but they just add it on as an expansion yeah uh, Man. Also, side note, Killer Instinct has one of the best soundtracks in video games. Fight me. Oh um, my god. The, the, the soundtrack from, <laughs> in that was amazing. And then like uh, the 2013 soundtracks were killer. I mean, uh, Cinder's theme was one of my favorites. Mick Gordon, hmm. Mick Gordon and Little V did an amazing fucking job on that. And then uh, I, I still think one of the best soundtracks I like, and I'm not a person who really likes rap I like at all. But I think TJ Combo's theme in the in the 2013 game was amazing. Omega Sparks had done a fucking phenomenal job. Yeah, 100%. Um, now, I say for season three, they had to switch to Cell Dweller, I believe, who did uh, Dead Rising 2. Yes! Uh, still worked out fantastically. I would argue, you know, makes more my thing, but still great OST. So, yeah, Killer Instinct. Uh, when's that coming back? Bring back KI. Oh my! Uh, did you see? Did you see when Maximilian had that? Uh, yeah. Like he got he got that shit trending on Twitter at like number three, and then he had the Twitch uh, Twitch Rivals thing uh, for a KI tournament, and it was it broke all kinds of records. Like oh sorry, the Marvel three one, the Ultimate Marvel versus Capcom three one, I think came first, and then uh, Killer Instinct he did that, and then that broke all the records, if I remember correctly. Like that broke their previous one. And it's just like, and then I stopped to think about it. Killer Instinct, as great as it is, the teams that made those are completely scattered now. Could a new mm. team actually do a new Killer Instinct and do the old one justice? Because it's, it'd be on a new engine, and you'd have to get people who are familiar with it. So, that's... I mean, Microsoft was throwing all that money around, Tony. All they need to do is like spend the money in the right places and rebuild the team, surely, right? I, I, I'm speaking out my ass. They probably would never do that, but that'll be a uh, yeah, dream come true. You're, you're not wrong, because Killer Instinct... Like, those teams are, like, with, like, I think some of, like, Amazon Games Now or something like that or or something like that. Like, all of them, like, are, like, did, like all over the place. So, yeah, Microsoft has the money. They have literally made so much, like, new studios. Like, they bought so many studios. But my, my question is, because it's Microsoft, are you actually going to utilize them is the question. Because so far with what the Xbox has shown us, it just, it just looks, looks pretty, pretty with graphics, but, but there's, there's not there's no, no exclusives for it yet. That we haven't seen, you know. I mean, fair play, backwards compatibility they're doing probably the best in the business. Still not good enough, um, and their exclusives. I mean, Halo Infinite's been pushed back, and I believe that's like the only big hitter they've got left, right? Um, there's no yeah. mention of a new gears. It's coming to PC as well, Halo Infinite. Yeah. So, so debatably not exclusive, really, but. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. I'm right there with you. They do need they need a couple of names. I've been begging mm. them, but I've been, I've been keeping them in my prayers that they they just break open the piggy bank and just go to Konami and say, what's it going to take for at least one of these big name franchises that you're just sitting on doing nothing with? Yeah, yeah. like you know, like hey, like, you know, here's some money, can, like you know, give us Castlevania. Like we'll we'll make yeah, you a new Castlevania game. We're not even going to ask for money. Here's our money. We're going to make one for you. Right, as much as I wouldn't want that, because then I would have to buy an Xbox Series X. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I would do it for Castlevania. I want a new Silent Hill, but yeah, I, I mean, Xbox should make it. I mean, I can't buy it if they do that, but like, it's gangbusters if they do it. Tony, your online handle, one big boss. What if they actually got Metal Gear? If they got Metal Gear, I would literally shit bricks, but I would also be very scared on how they would handle it because. I wasn't a fan of how MGS5 was handled, and I'm not going to say and sit here and say that it was all Konami. I think the way that Kojima had his thoughts for it, I think it was kind of the wrong way to take the direction of the game, but we do know Konami did have a major fucking problem with him, and I do think it was kind of like, they're just like, well, he spends a lot of money. It's like, dude, he makes you money. All the money that he's ever asked for, he's made that for you guys in, in your games for years, and to be fair... 
they forced him to continuously make Metal Gear games. Like, he wanted to stop after MGS3 Snake Eater. Like, he wanted to stop, and they kept making him do more shit. And then, you know, they got him to work on Silent Hills, and they fucked that up. Like, that, mm. I think Silent Hills literally could have been the greatest horror game of all time. Because I still to this day am scared shitless of that game. But when they kind of replicated it in Revelation, uh, sorry, in, in Village, RE Village, I wasn't scared of the giant potato baby. For some reason, that did, I, I think it scared me because... Dude, that traumatized me. Like, fuck, I, I, had to, I had to go for sit down. I could not, I like, could not I, play the game. When I saw it come around the corner for the first time, I didn't get scared. I don't, because you guys might not know this about me. I know my fans do, but I can't handle horror or gore in any way, shape, or form. I am like a, a, a coward when it comes to that shit. Like, I can't, I can't watch like that kind of stuff. But this, for some reason, didn't scare me. I got more scared of the mannequin that was on the table of Mia because I'm thinking to myself, is this going to be like that clown in RE7 that's going to pop up and stab me? Like, I was waiting for that, and the lights flickering in the room, and me couldn't see the, the mannequin on the table. That's where I think that they did the best part of freaking me out was that part. Not the baby chasing, because the baby was too slow, too. Like, I felt that, like, that part, that part could have been a bit longer, too. I think that should have been a lot longer than it was. To help my case and being a total coward baby here, right? Uh, <laughs> um, it was about four in the morning my time uh, on launch, not launch night, probably the day after because I had to do it in bursts. But uh, yeah, I literally heard the sounds and I must have seen like the glimmer of its hand touched and going around the court corner. I didn't see the thing again properly in any full view until I was in the lift. I not, I got onto the bed the wrong way as well, so I never saw it. Um, I think hearing it, just the sounds it made really peeled away my brain it hit that wrong part if you know what i mean ah okay so uh, that, that makes sense i can respect that yeah uh as for the doll yeah no i get you i was fully expecting that thing to jump up and grab me or something like it does in seven yeah uh, like, like reaching into its mouth and everything like that i'm like you gotta lose another finger dude you're losing another uh, finger you're, you're down a couple already dude <laughs> <laughs> oh, like i was i was literally like like like, like you couldn't see me because i'm I was wearing sunglasses and everything like that, but like I was like wincing my eyes. I was like, I don't want to be scared. I don't want to be scared. I don't want to be scared. Um, I th I think they did that part though well, and I I'm really hoping that like Capcom understands the importance of what they did. They took a an idea because that let's face it, that part was very Silent Hills. Like walking down that hallway, things changing. You know, like I I really hope that Capcom understands that they can do horror outside Resident Evil. Like I mean, they did it with. Haunting Ground, they did it with Dino Crisis. Uh, I really want them to give that a shot in the future, doing psychological horror, because I still am a firm believer of this. I don't know if you guys have seen me rant about this on Twitter, but I, I am a firm believer that RE7 was supposed to be its own game. Like, it was supposed to be a different game, a new horror IP from Capcom. But I think they got afraid that it wouldn't sell, so they slapped the Resident Evil name on it and changed some things towards the end. That, that's my, my, my theory, my, my crazy conspiracy theory. Let me get my tinfoil hat. Hmm. I I can see where you're coming from. I, I'm kind of glad it's part of a new arc, though. Yeah. Um, it's kind of the fact that we've got a consistent thing building up. It's been something we've missed since five. I feel like. Um, Not right. Yeah, you're right about that. You're very, you're extremely right about that, actually. Yeah. Since Wesker bit the dust, it, we've not really had any build up. It's just been here's a crisis and it's over by the end of the game. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. You know. So yeah. that. As a start of a new arc, I, I have to appreciate Seven with open arms. But I do get what you're saying in that at times it does feel like its own creature entirely. Mm. Yeah, I just I just uh, feel that they could do it. You know, I really feel that they could make their own horror game. And personally, I, I feel it's... think of, like I don't know if you guys know about this, but this is like kind of like what I also feel happened with uh, Mega Man. Mega Man got cancelled, like, outright by Capcom in, like, the early 2010s. Like, they cancelled so many, like, you know, Mega Man Legends 3, they cancelled all these other Mega Man projects... So Inafune went and made, you know, Kickstarter Mighty Number no. Nine, which was like at the time the most successful Kickstarter that had ever been done, and so that was gaining traction. There was all this great stuff coming out. I mean, we all know the game flopped and it was terrible, but um, that scared Capcom into making uh, Mega Man Eleven. So I'm just like, yeah. So like, why not just make, uh, you know, make a new horror game that's like Silent Hill scare konami and just be like shit you know what remember that thing that we used to do 
That, that, that thing where we, we pay people to make games and not cell phone stuff and pachinko machines. And you know what? Maybe we should get back on that because the, the, the hype for this game is getting real. Let's do this because, you know, in a perfect world, that would happen. <laughs> I, I would have hoped the same for Bloodstained, like nudging them into doing a proper Vania game. Right? Um, yeah. Because Bloodstained, nice. switch port aside, yeah. is a fantastic little game. Like, uh, I, I, I loved everything they did about that. Switch port aside, because I hear there's nothing but dog shit on that. Um, for whatever reason. Yeah, it, it uh, didn't do so well. Yeah, it didn't do so well on the Switch. But, yeah, I mean, like, I, I think that... I mean, because, you know, like, we're all older guys and everything like that. I don't think, like, the newer people understand, uh, like, uh, a lot of some of the things uh, we have gripes with the gaming world. But, you know, when you change too much to bring new people in, that's where you start screwing up. Like, if you try to do what's popular, you alienate your fans that have been with you. Like, because, like, Resident Evil, I get it. Like, you have to do different things. It's been a series for 25 years. But when they did things like Resident Evil 6, that was during the time that everybody was obsessed with, like, Call of Duty. Like, that early 2010 era. You know, like, Black Ops 2 and, you know, Call of Duty, eSports, everything. You know, if you start doing what's popular, but you lose your identity, people aren't going to want to play your game. People I, people sold, like, well, also, also, too, early 2010s, different in, era for the internet. But, um... Resident Evil 6 sold extremely well because people, there were, there weren't leaks like there are now, you know, like there's, you know, there's not as much, there wasn't as, as heavy as reporting. The internet wasn't as strong as it is now with uh, getting information. Um, I mean, yeah, you really think about it, like, yeah, eight, nine years ago, it was a very different time, but, you know, things change now. Companies are starting to pay attention. They're starting to realize, shit, we fucked up. People aren't gonna, but we maybe we should do this horror thing that Resident Evil used to be about, you know, like instead of just copying somebody, you know, because everybody wants to be Battle Royale now, you know, everybody wants to be Call of Duty, everybody wants to be the next Fortnite, and companies that are doing that just shouldn't do that. Like, I mean, you guys remember how bad it got with like DLC for some companies, right? Yeah, do you know this whole thing kind of makes me think that video game companies. It's okay to take influence from what's going on, but make it work with what you got. Don't just chase after it. Yeah. That's the difference. Like, look at something and go, okay, that's what's popular. Is there a way to integrate that instead of just go, oh, we're going to make one of them, just slap the logo on it. That's the, that's the big difference. Like, with Resident Evil, um, we haven't had a Battle Royale game. Um, we've had a crossover with PUBG. That's fine. Do that kind of thing if you if you want to do that. Like, yeah, cross promotional stuff. That yeah. Genre. yeah, don't you don't need to make your own. Like, so we should be thankful that that doesn't exist. I guess uh, I'm I'm like you. Like try different things, but just be more careful. I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, try new things, but try and keep it in the same universe, or you know, doesn't break reality to what fans would like expect. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, because like like what you said about the the. the... Uh, the crossover Resident Evil and PUBG, that was brilliant because you're not alienating your fans. You're trying to bring new fans in while not ruining the current games you're working on. Like you're not changing your ideals to fit the needs of uh, of the casual gamers. Because that that's the big problem. People are going for the casual gamer now, and it's like no, you don't you don't go for the casual gamer. Like yeah, if you're starting off like a brand new series, like if your game is brand new and stuff like that, you know, and you make it to be like that, then that's fine. But if you get a sequel. You don't forget the people that helped you sell the first game. Don't completely go off the rails and change it. You know, like, don't do that. Like, really, look at the blueprint from the original game. Like, why why was this successful before? What did we do? You know, did we work on this? And plus, obviously, like, we know how bad, like, crunch time is with a lot of companies. Like, these, these game developers don't get any kind of uh, respect or even insurance. Like, they get sick. I mean, like you guys. I mean, you guys heard about like how bad Naughty Dog was with a lot of their stuff. Like people were like sleeping in their offices and getting sick. Mm. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah, fucking it's Neil Druckmann. Definitely, definitely culture. Needs to change. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's there's a phrase, right? And it's like, don't reinvent the wheel. Yeah. And it's actually when you get when you think about that like specifically, that's what needs to be. Sure, it's fine to reinvent, but you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Every time somebody makes a new model of car, they change other parts, but they don't go, okay, we're going to have square wheels to see what it's like. <laughs> reinvent, but you don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that reminds me of that old Simpsons episode where he found out he had a half brother and his, uh, he was played by um, what's his name, Danny DeVito. And he wanted, to, wasn't it? Yeah, he wanted to make the. He's like, he's got to design a car. It's like, but he has no idea what he's doing. Sarah, it's like, I don't care. He's the man. We're building cars for guys like him. And he builds that fucking car with the two bubbles. And it. And he's like, this is Stephanie. <laughs> I remember. Oh god, he ruins his career as well, doesn't he? Yeah, it makes him broke. It, like, it literally bankrupts him. He's like, I'm ruined. Yeah, like, no, it's that episode of The Simpsons Games Company. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Danny Vito? Yeah, uh, Unky Herb. Uh, Unky yeah. Herb. He's like, yeah, he opens, like, he opens, like in the sequel, where, like the episode where he comes back, he opens the door. He's like, Herb. <laughs> he just punches him right in the face. <laughs> Simpsons oh. references. Now you're talking my language. Oh god, dude! Like, like that, that's <laughs> another podcast I'll have to do with the Simpsons. Because I, I love the Simpsons. My, my buddy, like, I actually never played the Simpsons Hit and Run. So my a good buddy of mine, he, he, he and I, like, uh, he's on the the Power Rangers show that we both work on. Like, he's one of the actors on it. Uh, we just like talk Simpsons all the way down there. And on one of my streams, I, I actually my Game Boy night, I played uh, Bart Simpson Escape from Camp Deadly. It's an old Game Boy game. Really, really tough game. Like a lot of old Simpson games. And I started doing, like, Groundskeeper Willie's voice on it. And uh, you, you guys know um, uh, Bun- uh, Bundy, Bundicott on Twitter? I do, yeah. Yeah, he, um, he's Scottish. So Proxy, uh, he clipped it, and he sent it over, I, I, and I sent it to him. And he's like, I actually did pretty good with that accent, dude. And like, Because I remember I did uh, a Scottish accent before for Bundy, and he's like, you just butchered my people's accent. <laughs> but I was doing, like, Groundskeeper Willie, and he's just like, He's like, eh, don't let the wee one mind you, none. His father's gonna go crazy and turn him into Haggis. He's like, what's Haggis? <gasps> Boy, you read my thoughts. You've got the shit in. You mean shining. Shh, you wanna get sued? <laughs> oh, good memories. I, I, I love Ground Steve, like, out of, like, out of, like, the Simpson characters that aren't the, the main Simpson family. Like, he is, like, one of my top favorite characters. He's so great. Uh, I've got to shoot off. I'm afraid. Yeah, uh, no, yeah, we we could drop it. Yeah, we've been at this for yeah like two hours and thirteen minutes. Like this was, this was good. Like this is this is what it means to do podcasts, having shit like this, just going like off the rails on everything. <laughs> it's it's so funny because when we do the show, it's like, it's great fun, but it is kind of like work. I have to have show notes and stuff like this. For this, it's just just it's just chilling. It was yeah, good. have a conversation. Well, just, just shoot the shit and have fun. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, you guys are very, uh, the word I'm looking for, structured. You're very structured on how you do it, like, how you have your, your segments and everything. And then, like, you, I know, like, you chop it up and everything. And then you uh, you have the thing where it's like, oh, yeah, if you if you don't want to hear about, like, you know, like, this part of the, the podcast and you want to get to this or this is the spoiler section, you guys actually have the, the numbers. You just click on it. It takes you right to it. I was just like, that's, that's the way to do shit. Um, again, like, it's very organized. You guys are very detailed. At, and, again, that's one why I think you're – one of the best podcasts I listen to because you put so much effort into them. And again, YouTube needs to stop being a bag of dicks and give you guys, cause you guys only got like, what, like a, like a thousand subscribers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. just like, nah, time for you guys to get more. Like you guys deserve like way more. Like, cause I, I, on my YouTube channel, this one, I've only got about like 1,600 and I've been here for a decade. I'll be, it'll be a decade in October, but, um, you guys literally are just like consistent. And I'm just like YouTube, they're consistent. Like, who do I gotta fucking kidnap to make this shit happen, okay? <laughs> like, I will go full American here if I have to. <laughs> YouTube's just just a garbage website. I mean, I didn't... When we started it, it was never our intention to have YouTube as a big platform, but then, as you say, we started making, like, all these top five videos and stuff. So you kind of have to. Like, there's nowhere else to go. I mean, we're having just, fun. That's the important part, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. But, I mean, overall, yeah, you guys are having fun. But, like, this, this is my thing as, as a content creator and as a photographer, too. Like, I, I work with so many cosplayers that do such amazing work, and nobody gives a fuck about them because they don't do, like, what the, the meta is right now. Like, what everybody's doing is, like, lewds and boudoir and shit like that and nudes. Like, that's, like, the big thing in cosplay. But that's not what cosplay is. But that's what a lot of people gravitate towards instead of the real shit. It's, like, people making... Badass. Not that there's nothing wrong with anything losing news because I shoot that for people who do OnlyFans and everything. But you know, I, it's like you know, it's about costume making too. It's about having fun, getting together. And you know, some of my friends like they'll make amazing armor. They'll make stuff that's like right out of the game or the show. And they got like you know, 800 followers and stuff. And I'm like, no, this ain't fair. Anything. You know, like me, like I, I don't care. Like, I like doing this for fun. I would love to do it full time. But 
you know, you guys have, like, I, I look at the talent you guys have, and I'm like, I want more for these guys. I want more! <laughs> yeah, I think we appreciate that very much. It is it is just, we, we do it for the fun of it. We're still having fun with it. Um, and we're just doing it, because... Yeah, we enjoy doing it. It is on the cards. It's the plan, right? You know, um, it's, but it's uh, steps. Right, yeah, exactly. Steps, yeah. Step like, Sorry, I, 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 get, I, get, I get, I'm one of those people that like, I get really excited like when I see people like that are friends of mine like just doing good and shit like that. Like, I just want like more for them. I want like the world for them. Like, I want good shit to happen to them and stuff. And I just see this, and I'm just that's why I'm just like more. God damn it! <laughs> more love to these people. Because, like, I mean, sometimes you see people that just throw up a video on YouTube and shit like that, and it gets, like, you know, 100K, and it's like, you didn't even, like, do anything with this. Like, why why are you getting this? Like, there are people that are working their asses off. I know exactly what that feeling's like. It, it does, though, but, like, you know, and that's that's one of the things that, like, you know, because I've been, I felt that way about my photography for the longest time, but, like, and a, a lot of cosplayers that I follow and have become friends with here on Twitter through the Resident Evil community, a lot of them are, like, afraid to, like, post something that's not Resident Evil related because they're known for Resident Evil stuff. And I was like, look, dude, like, if you lose followers because you posted something non-Resident Evil, big deal. Like, the real people are here. You can't... Because, like, one of my, my good friends, you guys may have seen her cosplays that I shoot. It's Crescent Kitty cosplay. She does the Jill Valentine. Mm, yeah. She gets really down on herself when she sees, like, people, like, when she loses views or she does something different and she really, and she really takes it to heart. And I was like, look, 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 look. Don't worry about the numbers that you lose. Don't worry about the people that say negative shit about you. She was getting big on TikTok, but the, I guess, like, for Overwatch community stuff on TikTok is really toxic. Um, but I told her, I was like, for all the negative shit that's out there, it takes the one good thing to make you keep going. And whether it's somebody sharing your video, just hitting that like button, retweeting it or commenting on a video you do you know you have it out there it might not be a thousand followers but you like it's kind of like what something like my grandfather used to say and i guess i can like rework this for modern era if you can count five good friends on your hand you're doing good in life and i guess like if you've got like five good viewers that love what you do then you're not doing bad at all because at the end of the day, you're more real than some like some social media influencers. Like you got like you know a lot of people are, like that are in cosplay or content creating, they're real. And I like I said like that's why I want to see you guys continue to do more and and get more because you guys are real. You do these things and everyone's got to be in the comments like he sounds like a fucking fanboy right now. Like what's he trying to get out of this? <laughs> well, you know we did we did slip Tony like a good like two hundred dollar bill before this. No, we didn't. I mean, I wish! If it was $200, I'd be, like, literally, like, on my feet bowing to you, like, on camera. I, I have no shame. <laughs> well, what was it? What was it? Well, yeah, because, like, on, on Row, Bob Spaghetti will always, like, uh, talk about, like, the shirts that we have, the Row merch. And uh, I was just like, yeah. Because, like, you know, like, people are out there. People are rude. People are like, oh, they're selling out. They're selling merch. And, like, I was telling Bob, I was like, no, Bob, on stream, you got to say, we're not selling out. We're buying in. <laughs> exactly exactly that i mean everybody sells merch you guys sell merch and shit like that yeah. you know people ask for it you do it i'm gonna be selling merch too I, i've got like a bunch of artist friends of mine because I, I can't do on the level of what they can for shirts they're gonna make me a bunch of stuff so i'm paying them too like they didn't they're like no you don't have to pay me dude i'm like you're fucking getting my money asshole you're taking my fucking money because you're my friend i'm gonna fucking pay you so be fucking happy i'm giving you money <laughs> you don't have to be a starving artist <laughs> Exactly. It's exactly that. It's about listening well, to that core audience, yeah. the people that actually comment on stuff and respond to stuff. If your numbers go down, it sucks. But they're just numbers on a screen. The people that actually comment uh, and get back to you and stuff, that's that's what you do it for. That's that's the real reason. So that's why we keep on trucking. That's why our YouTube, like we like I said, we're consistently putting out stuff. The views aren't overly great most of the time. But that's a treasure trove of content that someone's going to stumble into and like binge all of it and become a fan and and hopefully like find that proper connection. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, I think that's like the best like thing that you can hope for uh, is like when people in the future because some people are like oh like these videos are getting buried they're not getting seen and it's just like you know and people out there like whether like you know like whether you're a content creator or like a cosplayer or you're you know whatever the case may be like if you need something like shared and retweeted like don't be afraid to ask people for help because the the, the one thing that I, this is what i hate about social media social media is damaging to people who have social anxiety 
who feel that they f- will fail if they don't have like you know uh, like a certain like number or nobody cares. But social media keeps you down. They lock you behind these walls. Like you can create like the most amazing like photos and you're not going to get seen because you don't have a high traffic coming to you. So just, you know, don't be afraid to like make a, a, a tweet or a, a, an Instagram story or a fleet or whatever the case may be. Make that stuff and ask people. It's like, hey, this is tanking really hard. I worked really hard. People will retweet it for you. Like I've done it. I've asked for help before. I as a, a very, I mean, I have my pride and stuff, and it does make me like, oh, people are not going to like it. But I, I do it because I, like, you know, I want my work to be seen. Um, I, I'm exactly the same. I, I, I don't like to do it, but you're so right. If I see something, um, if somebody tags me in something that they've clearly worked hard on, and I, I will go, oh, wow, this is awesome. It absolutely deserves a retweet. Like, yeah. if I can see that you're putting the time in, I don't care how many followers you got. Yeah. You reward hard work. You don't reward numbers. Exactly. Um, yeah, and I also like for the people out there, like you know, for the people that say no to you or don't want to work with you because you don't have numbers, keep a list. Remember those numbers because when they come looking for you later. Yeah. I think so. It's like, oh, sorry, I'm 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 too busy right now. I can't do this because like I I've had that. Like when I, I I've been doing photography for like a decade, and I only had my photography Instagram for about five. So, because I didn't realize that, I was just like, oh, yeah, shit, I can do, the, that's, like, the way to go now. And I have people who didn't want to work with me because I didn't even have, like, a thousand followers yet, right? But my work, I mean, you guys have seen my work, you know. Um, it's, uh, people didn't want to work with me because I didn't have the numbers. And all of a sudden, I started, you know, I got over a thousand, and then I'm starting to get featured in cosplay magazines. And then those people that didn't want to work with me, all of a sudden, they're coming back around. And I'm like, really? Because I thought because you had, like... 30k followers and everything like that that i wasn't worthy of your time like sorry i'm not working with you you said no to me before like you know and, I, and all of a sudden because like i'm you you're recognizing my numbers not my talent granted in in like the five years like in the 10 years i my skills at editing have gotten better and stuff but like when some of these people i asked to work with my editing was like really good so yeah like don't be afraid people don't let numbers don't let the numbers uh mess with your head that's the best that's the best advice i can give it's um, it's kind of like coming full circle, really, because you saying all that makes me think. You know, when you came on first aid spray, it was like episode nine. Like we we were still pretty young. Yep. Um, so to have someone from Row who's like huge channel, and since then we've had guests from s- several other places, other big Resident Evil channels that we've been fans of for a long time. We've worked with Crimson Head. We t- uh, worked with the Resident Evil R. podcast. R. Yeah. Yeah. And they've all been so gracious with their time. And they have they didn't they didn't look at us and go oh it's just it's just some crappy new podcast. Uh, they went yeah you see the amount of work you're putting into this let's do something and yeah come a full circle with the, the the wonder of the community and 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 especially the creative side of it and how everybody from there just sort of connects to support each other. I love that. Yeah, uh, yeah no uh, no word of a lie. The like the way people have come to work with our you know FAS. Uh, and we're very much like uh, little fish in a big pond, really. When you look at it, it's like it, it's fucking mind blowing, uh, and we appreciate appreciate all of it. You know, it's mm. easy. Absolutely. We uh, when we it's funny. We mentioned Sunny earlier when we recorded something with Sunny a while ago. Um, I said to to the rest of the guys on, I was like, I, I still feel like we're the baby of the Resident Evil sort of <laughs> podcast community in terms of you know numbers and the length of time we're doing it. And Sonny was like, you guys make so much content, you're like the giant baby from Spirited Away. <laughs> I'll never forget that. It's that's a great line. That's awesome. I love that, man. That, 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 is, that is great. Um, all right, then. Well, yeah, because I know, I know you said you got to... I got to bounce. I got to boo-boo. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So, uh, again, uh, thank you guys for coming on. Like, you know, I, I know this was, like, extended and shit like that, but uh, I really want to thank you guys... Uh, for taking the time out to come on to this. This was this was a blast. And we've got content for future podcasts now, too. Absolutely. Let's do a couple of yeah, solo shows now. Again. Yeah, no, definitely. Like, uh, what was it? I mean, uh, like I said, anytime. Like, you know, you guys got to... Because, like, I did a podcast last Saturday with uh, a Resident Evil cosplayer named Lost in Nightmares. He cosplays Westeries, like, one of the best Westeries I've ever seen. Um, 
he uh, he was like, yeah, dude, like, uh, can I come back on? Like, I got an idea. And I was like, shoot, fuck yeah, dude, come on back. Because, like, our first one we did, we talked about, like, Darkstalkers. And this one we talked about, like, more, like, Capcom and, like, more even more fighting games and shit like that. Because he's a big fighting game guy, too. So, um, all right. So that, that's, the, that's the end. Again, guys, thank you for watching. Uh, for everybody that's uh, tuned in for listening for the last two hours and 30 minutes almost, thank you. I uh, greatly appreciate that. Please thumbs up and subscribe because it's free. And this day and age... Freeze a damn good thing. As always, everybody, thank you for listening. I want to be boss, and I'll see you all next time.